Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen stepdaughter scammed me for $10,000. Fake names for privacy. I have three kids, Bea, 23 female, Amy, 20 female, and Liz, 15 female. Bea is technically my stepdaughter and I only mention it because it's relevant to the story. My husband Ben and I have a deal with our kids that as long as they are studying, we will pay for all their expenses and they may be at home rent free. If they feel that college isn't for them, then they need to get a job. We feel it's their life and their choice, but Ben and I won't enable them to do nothing. Amy is earning a degree and Liz is still in high school. Bea told us that college wasn't for her. We said okay and helped her apply for jobs. She got hired as a receptionist but only works part time. We just asked that she pitch in for groceries under $75 a month and help with chores. She was not charged for her room or for water or electric bills. We also paid for her car and its insurance. They only had to pay for gas. She also has all of her essentials, soap, toothpaste, etc. provided by us. She needs to follow the house rules. Be kind and respectful to every member of the house. You may stay up past 10 p.m., but must be quiet since other people have work or school. Turn off devices you aren't using to conserve electricity and improve the Wi-Fi. We don't approve of smoking, but if you're going to do it, you have to do it outside and dispose of it properly, etc. Ben and I always believed that our rules were fair and reasonable. That was all the background. Here's the reason I'm posting. In January, Bea approached us explaining that our occupational center was offering courses and she wanted to take them so she could become certified and get a better paying job. The tuition for the course, plus extra fees because of books and other required supplies, would come out to over $10,000. Ben and I wrote her a check because, as I said, we will help all of our kids with their education. We asked about two weeks ago if she would be having a graduation ceremony and Bea replied that she didn't know. Ben and I called the occupational center to ask so we could make sure to get the day off work. We asked for three different workers who all confirmed that the course Bea claimed to have been enrolled in hadn't been offered at that center for years. We do more digging and discover that Bea had gambled away most of the money and spent the rest on things that go against our rules. Needless to say, we were livid with her. We couldn't believe that she would lie and betray our trust like that. We told Bea that we had expected all the money paid back by the end of the year and for her to pay us a $400 monthly rent. If not, she's out of the house. Time to grow up, be an adult, and take accountability. Bea's biological mom, Zoe, is calling me a jerk and trying to make it seem as if I'm the wicked stepmother and just hate Bea. She's saying things like I've turned Ben against Bea and Bea can't do anything fun anymore because of the rent rule. Ben and I feel Bea needs some serious boundaries, but Zoe's words have made me doubt myself. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You know you're never going to see that money, right? Bea lied to you to keep living rent free and she scammed you out of $10,000 on top of that. I'd kick her out right now, not wait nine months for her to cause more mischief. By the way, in the future, pay the tuition, residence, books, etc. bills directly rather than cutting the student a check. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or Bea? Please let us know. If biological mom has such a strong opinion, maybe Bea should move in with her. Am I the jerk for telling my friend I don't care about her feelings? I'm getting married in two weeks. Last week was my bachelor party and several of my friends attended, women and men. During the party, one of my female friends, let's give her the name Kelly, got very drunk and confessed to me how she's not happy that I'm getting married and that she thinks my future wife is not a good match for me. She also confessed she's been in love with me since we were 21, now we're 27, and that it hurt her feelings how I never realized and never did anything about it. Due to the fact that she was drunk, I completely ignored what she said, and I was like, fine, okay, whatever, at that moment. I waited till she got sober to see if she'd say anything about this again. Two days after the party, she texted me and asked me if I thought about what she had said. 
I told her to elaborate just to make sure she's talking about her confession. She was indeed talking about it, and I told her exactly what I thought. I told her I don't care what she thinks about me and my fiancé being a good match, and she's not the best judge if she claims that she's in love with me. I also told her that I truly don't care about her feelings towards me, and I don't know what she expected to achieve. She was shocked to see me responding like that, and she was like, you don't need to be rude about it. I replied, telling her that of course I'll be rude. She's trying to ruin my wedding by thinking confessing to me will change something. Told her to come back to reality and realize she's not playing in a movie and her confession is embarrassing. And instead of letting it go and blaming it on the alcohol, she pushed it and expected to see whether she'd actually have succeeded. I told her at this point, I don't care about her at all. That girl is apparently exposing me to her friends. She didn't tell them the whole story and I had to explain to everyone what she had really said and expected. My friends kept insisting that I acted like a jerk and just because I'm getting married, that gives me no right to invalidate my friends' feelings towards me. Am I the jerk? Edit. I also want to clarify one thing. Kelly has not been a good person towards my fiancé at all, especially during our first years together. She only fixed her attitude after I had several fights with her regarding boundaries. Due to her fixed attitude, I believe she changed truly. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Kelly? Please let us know. Kelly Kelly Bobelli B5 Bobelli B. $6 per week. This is from a few years back, but it's a good one. I was working as a shipwright at the time, which if you're not familiar with the term, means I was basically a nautical carpenter. A carpenter in a shipyard. Well, it was a union job. Everyone in the yard got paid the same. But since shipwrights generally bring bags of their own personal tools to the job, we got paid an extra 15 cents an hour to compensate us for wear and tear. You just write OT on your time card at the end of the day, so the payroll department knew to put you down at the own tools rate. Anyway, it seemed to me at the time to be a fairly reasonable setup. So one Friday, the foreman says that the yard isn't going to be paying the own tools bonus any longer. Seemed kind of petty to me, but there wasn't anything much to be done about it. So at quitting time, I just took my bags with me and went home. In other words, I took home all my saws, squares, drivers, basically everything that is required to do any shipwright work. I didn't really give it another thought until Monday morning rolled around and the foreman was assisting tasks for the day. He tells me, Okay, OP, the some such boat is sitting out behind Dry Dock 9. They need a cabinet of some sort built in their wheelhouse. Go ahead and get after it. I say, no problem. I'm just going to need a saw, a square, a driver, a pencil, you see where this is going. So the foreman just stares for a second and says, where are all your tools? Well, you said we weren't getting paid to bring our own bags anymore, so I took mine home. What's the problem? This guy spent the better part of two days searching for enough equipment for me to be able to get this project started, and even then the tools he found were just worn out junk, so everything took three times as long to accomplish. I spent the two days methodically sweeping out the shop, about 35 times. We were getting paid roughly $40 an hour at the time, so I figured the yard spent about $600 paying me to sweep the shop repeatedly in order to avoid paid me $6 per week to keep performing my actual job. If that's not good management, I don't know what is. I had a work friend from two jobs back suddenly tell me point blank on the ride home that he would no longer be paying me gas money because I'm charging him too much. I didn't bother arguing with him as he tended to get into these kinds of moods. When we got to his house, I wished him good night and good luck finding another ride. He laughed it off and said I was a funny guy. Next morning, I drove straight to work instead of swinging by to pick him up. I had enough time to get myself a pre-work snack and a drink. While I was enjoying my treat in the break room before work, I got a text asking me where I was. I said I was at work and stopped answering texts. He had a slice of humble pie and said he would pay my rates. I did some math to break down how much it was costing me to drive to pick him up. Turns out I was asking for too little gas money for how much his leg of the trip was costing me. So I increased my rates and funnily enough, he didn't argue this time. I was told to do what I needed to do, so I did it. This is very recent. I was living in a very bad part of a major metropolitan city that has lots of bad parts. After I moved in, I started noticing a lot of things that were unsafe. Most of the things I brushed aside because they didn't necessarily affect me. 
Three things I complained about were the fact that the common areas and most of the bedrooms had no smoke detectors. Then, because I get home when it's very dark, I complained about the porch lights not working. I was promised over and over that this would be fixed, but it never was. I pressed harder and threatened to call the city. I also withheld my rent at this point. The landlord, she was a lady, told me, There's nothing wrong with the house. Do what you need to do. So I did. I called the city. An inspector came out and I showed him around the property. There were areas I couldn't give him access to, like the garage or the other tenants' rooms. He took lots of pictures and pointed out dozens of safety issues and building code violations. Turns out, this slumlord, referring to the owner, converted a two-story house, four bed, two bath, into a three-story house with nine bedrooms and nine bathrooms with no permits from the city. He, the owner, also had the home classified as an owner-occupied, single-family home, although it was clearly not, as there was no owner-occupancy and there were ten unrelated roommates. The landlord, the lady, harassed me through the whole process. She took my parking spot away and pitted other roommates against me. To make matters worse, she told everyone I wasn't paying rent, so now I have all these jerks ganging up on me. It was so bad that I couldn't be in any of the common areas for even one minute without being harassed. I also got a bunch of notices accusing me of random things and an eviction notice because I wasn't paying rent. The report from the city came out and it had over a dozen violations, including some very serious ones. It was going to cost him tens of thousands of dollars to repair the house to get it up to standard. The house started to become safer. There were smoke detectors, railings for the stairs, working porch lights, a carbon monoxide alarm, and he was forced to put a railing on the balcony that had none. Through all of this, he, the owner, is making $10,000 per month in rent, charging for parking, and there's another large house on the property that he's renting. Plus, he, the owner, has multiple homes, 90 tenants in all. This guy, the owner, was making tons of money, but somehow the sentiment among some of the roommates was, how could you do this to this poor old man, the owner. My case went to court and I got more time to find legal help. By the time the second hearing came along, another notice had been given as they got access to the entire house. Plus, they were still in violation and had not cured all of the problems, so they got fined daily. Then my court date was a week away, and his attorney started to try and negotiate with me. I was asking for $16,000, and they knew I was going to get it because they were going to lose. I ended up settling for $7,000 and 30 days to move out, plus 8 months of rent forgiveness. I just did what I had to do. Edit. Some people are calling this post fake because of the fact that I've referred to a male and a female in my post. The landlord slash manager is female and the owner is male. It's pretty common for the owner of a home to hire someone to manage the properties, especially since this owner has 90 tenants. I'm not sure what's so suspicious about that. So now I've gone through and put notes throughout my posts to help the people with reading comprehension issues who are so stuck in every little detail that they're missing the big picture. Hope everyone can stop complaining about this now. Edit 2. I've learned a lot from the multiple times I've dealt with awful landlords. Living in Los Angeles with the huge problem of slumlords, you start to learn your rights and get sick of the crap and report it. So I will always withhold rent if my rights are being violated or the house is unsafe and the owner slash landlord refuse to do anything about it. And for those that are saying he got off easy, it's so much easier to get rent forgiveness than money. Many people advise against withholding rent but it has worked in my favor every single time because it either got the landlord to make repairs or it got the landlord to take me to court and I got a settlement and rent forgiveness. Example, in this case, it was much easier for the owner to swallow $7,000 plus eight months of rent forgiveness than $15,000. I originally asked for $16,000, so that's just $1,000 less, in essence, than what I asked for. So no, he didn't get off easy here. It would be different if I was harmed by his neglect, but I wasn't. Plus, usually the only way you get money from an eviction case is by settling. Eviction judges are there to determine evictions, not give out money. Yes, there are exceptions, but I would have most likely won and not gotten evicted because I would have agreed to move. But to get money, you usually have to take them to court separately and get a new attorney. It's so much easier to settle. In fact, at the initial hearing, the judge orders you to go out in the hallway and negotiate before you go to plead your case. Judges much prefer when agreements are made. 
They also tend to throw out cases when the landlord and or their attorney is trying to be manipulative and or unreasonable and the tenant doesn't have legal representation. Judges hate to evict people, especially in Los Angeles. I do not understand why landlords are like this. It's literally so easy to be a likable landlord. I have a tenant who thought there was damp in one room. OMG, thank you for protecting my investment and letting me know. I'll take care of that right away. Cost me $300 now, but saved me thousands later. If you're not keeping some of your income back for maintenance, then frankly, you're a bad landlord who has short-sighted abilities. Hey, this stove looks like it's on its last legs. Three burners aren't great. No problem, here's a new one. What day can we come out and put it in for you? Again, $400 fix to keep a tenant who is, and I cannot stress this enough, paying for this service. I keep a tenant who pays one time and just lives their life normally. Taking care of their property is also taking care of mine. They know their house is safe. Win-win. Am I the jerk for telling my dad his wife was the one who didn't want me on their family trip? Last year, my dad and I, 20 male, barely found each other. My mom went back to Mexico after I was born. We came back to the States when I was seven and she didn't know how to find him. Luckily, I got matched with my uncle on Ancestry DNA, who's my dad's brother, so we went from there. He never knew about this whole time and for over a year, we've been catching up and being in each other's lives. My dad has two kids with his wife. My younger brother is eight and my sister is three. We have hung out a lot and I love them. We get excited seeing each other. My dad says they think it's cool about having an older brother. One with a car who can take them to the park in particular. Not gonna lie, with his wife it's a little weird because we don't know how to address each other. Then obviously this was a surprise to her. But we always say hi and small talk when we're around but don't talk too much. So in a couple months, everyone in his family like my grandparents, all my uncles and cousins on his side want to go on a family vacation. Thing is, she doesn't want me to go with them because it's the only tradition that's still the same from before I was around and she knows his attention won't be fully on them if I'm there. She asks me to do her this one favor when I get to be around my dad any other day. So give her this time but don't tell him she said anything. At first, I wasn't going to tell my dad she told me all this stuff but after telling them that I can't go, he kept asking why. And then my grandparents and uncle were saying, how come I can't go? They were willing to change which date to go on the vacation if I'm too busy on that day. It was really sweet that they wanted me to go, so I didn't know what else to do except tell my dad. He wasn't happy when I told him. He did say sorry for her making me feel unwelcome to go, but everyone wants me there, so don't worry about that. She literally came to my place the other day to tell me she hopes I'm happy. They got into it and he doesn't want to talk to her right now because of what she did. Honestly, I've never seen her that mad or sad but she was saying it's all my fault because she thought it was a reasonable request after having to put up with me being in their lives. The thing is, yeah, I'm glad my dad and me are getting to know each other. I've never had a dad before so now it means a lot to have this relationship with him and everyone else in the family. She's his wife so I get it can't always be about what I want. Now, because of telling him, I brought up all these problems and I'm wondering if I'm the jerk for it. Not the jerk. She knew what she was asking was wrong or she wouldn't have asked you to keep it a secret that she asked you not to go. She's incredibly selfish and the fight between her and your dad is of her own making. Right? If it was such a reasonable request, then she shouldn't mind at all that OP told his father about it. She knows she's full of it. Not the jerk. It wasn't a reasonable request and she knows that which is why she asked you to keep it secret. She's mad at your father, not you, but she's taking it out on you. That's childish, disgusting behavior on her part. You and your father have a right to have a relationship. It's just sad she's so insecure in her relationship with him that she sees you as some sort of a threat to it. It sounds like you're a good person and you deserve better. Your dad is standing up for you. He cares about you. Keep that in mind going forward. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for not allowing mother-in-law to cook her husband a separate dinner when he didn't like what I made? Mother-in-law has some unhealthy tendencies in her marriage. She's obsessed with her husband. I'm talking about separation anxiety level obsessed and she thinks the sun shines from him. He married her when my husband was a young teen and enabled her to relinquish custody of her kids. So for that alone, he is some knight in shining armor in mother-in-law's eyes. She takes on a very traditional role in their marriage and is very into cooking for him. Mother-in-law's husband is a nice guy. I'm not trying to knock him, but he is definitely used to being catered to. 
They came to visit recently and I made dinner for the entire family, which is of course a lot of effort and I expect it to be appreciated. Mother-in-law's husband, Jake from now on, took one bite, made a face, was quiet for a minute and then excused himself. When he came back to the table, mother-in-law drew a lot of attention to asking him what was wrong. He was clearly embarrassed and I asked if he hated the food. He said he was sorry, but he couldn't eat that. I said that was fine and he was welcome to make a sandwich or something. Mother-in-law went into the kitchen with him and when I went to check, she was actually going to cook him a steak. I asked what she was doing and told her he could have a sandwich or a snack, but she isn't going to cook him a whole steak. I said he can really get his own food so mother-in-law can sit down. Mother-in-law got upset and I said that I get he doesn't like the food and that's okay, but I don't like the idea of his wife making him a replacement meal, so please sit down and he can make a sandwich. Mother-in-law sat down but was huffy. Jake made a sandwich and when he came back, he stood in the doorway and made a dumb, confused face like he had no idea what went on. Later at the dinner, mother-in-law began teasing him by putting the food near him in his mouth. Him not liking it is one thing, but at this point, I was very insulted. Jake was acting freaked out and said he didn't even want to smell it and to stop. I was upset and asked her to leave the table. After dinner, mother-in-law berated me about being controlling, condescending, and treating them like kids. She said I'm a bad host for making everyone uncomfortable, and I should have let her make a mistake and ignored that they were joking. Jake jumped in and said he knows I'm being judgy about him not knowing how to make a sandwich and said I should worry about my own life because he has stuff he judges us for and that I'm a bad host for putting orange juice in the food, though no one had a problem but him. Not the jerk. I have a great aunt that will literally stop what she's doing to drive home to make her husband lunch every day. He's perfectly capable of making it himself, he just doesn't want to. She's always shocked when we don't want to center our day around her husband's lunch. Your mother-in-law went into your kitchen to cook her toddler husband your steak without asking you first. They were incredibly disrespectful on multiple levels. They both acted like kids, so you treated them like kids. I don't see the problem here. You shouldn't host them for dinner again without an apology. Who goes into someone else's kitchen and grabs a steak as a replacement meal? Like, of all the food, you grab possibly the most expensive item? Then act shocked when the host doesn't want you to eat an expensive piece of meat when a sandwich would do? Entitled Karen gets cancelled. I'm a customer services manager for a very large entertainment slash broadband company. Part of my job is listening to calls raised off to me by my agents in relations to complaints, etc. One of my agents had a customer on the line going mental about her daughter's phone and broadband services being restricted for not paying. Customer claims the last person she spoke to said her bill would be cleared and she didn't have to pay. So I listened to that call and the customer is awful from the get-go making fun of the advisor's name, the name being Merlin. She was making jokes about her being a wizard and how stupid her name was mainly, shouting at her for over an hour about how we've committed fraud because we won't read her daughter's bank details out on the call to her. Then she starts getting mad when the advisor tells her we couldn't take payments because three different credit cards were declined on the account in three different months. This goes on for an hour and 45 minutes and I feel so bad for the advisor at this point. Customer starts going mental that her daughter never has credit cards, again that we've committed fraud and she's coming to the agent's call center to find her. When the agent asks how we could possibly have committed fraud, the customer puts her foot in it, goes into a rage, and then tells her she let her daughter, who's only 17, go into the store and take the broadband contract with us and the customer knew she had to be over 18, how it was our fault and blah 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 for not doing our checks and so on. Her daughter came on the line screaming just as bad as her too. Our customers need to be at least 18 to have contracts with us. We run basic debt checks to see if they have defaulted accounts with us, but nothing more. After raising the account off to the fraud team, I had the pleasure of calling them back to tell them they were canceled with immediate effect. Of course, she started screaming at me until I told her I wasn't here to be screamed at. It clearly wasn't up for discussion and that I'd be hanging up. If she had been nice and not acted like she was on a pedestal and untouchable, then the services wouldn't have been cancelled. Don't you love when loudmouth Karens do themselves in like this? If you want a refund, you have to buy the product from us first. The day was like any average retail day. The store I work at is run relatively well, so the day passes by smoothly. That is, until about an hour before my shift ended, 
when a teenager comes up to my desk hoping to return some computer parts. This includes RAM, a motherboard, and a CPU. He doesn't have the receipts, however, receipts are not required as long as I can find the transactions in my point of sale system. Thankfully, he has an account and I'm able to find the RAM and motherboard. The RAM I was able to give him a refund on, no issue. However, the motherboard was about 50 days old. Our return policy is 30 days, but I was feeling nice. He is a kid after all, and I remember how confusing I found the world when I was his age, which was not that long ago, but feels like a lifetime. I told him I couldn't give him his money back, but he could exchange it for a new one, or get a gift card, which was standard practice for returns outside of 30 days, but within 60. Teen. Well, I can't have a gift card. My dad will get mad. Me. Okay, but I can't give you money back. You are well over the return period, so it's either gift card or an exchange. Kid. I guess I'll get a new motherboard then. Me. Which one do you want? The same one, I guess. At this point, I realized that I had forgotten why he wanted to return it. It wasn't required anymore, as any open product at this point would be sent back to the distributor for inspection anyway. Turns out, his computer wasn't working after he put it all together, so he needed new stuff. Kid. Yeah, I don't know why it's not working. Me. Okay. Did you want to go look around for other stuff? Or did you want me to call a salesman over to grab you another board? Just give me a new one. Now, are you going to refund me for the CPU? I hadn't gotten to the CPU yet, as I was still pretty new to returns, and I was doing them one at a time to make sure I didn't mess up. Now, of course I have to be extra careful about returns, making sure the item is the correct one and all of that. Now, I have to be extra careful with CPU returns. So I opened up the package to do my checks, and I instantly realized why this customer's computer wasn't working. For those not in the know, the CPU is a small square chip that essentially acts as a computer's brain. Super important and extremely fragile piece of equipment. Depending on the brand of CPU, there may or may not be pins on the bottom that are essential for the functionality of both the CPU and the rest of the computer. They are extremely easy to bend and break. However, it's also extremely easy to not bend and break them, so there really isn't a good reason for someone to damage a CPU. This kid's CPU looked like he had taken a hammer to it. Me. Well, this is why your computer isn't working. What? The pins are smashed. Nothing at the computer can work with damage like this. Oh, well, can I return it? I didn't want to say anything yet because I felt bad for the kid, but we were unlikely to take it back due to the damage and that he clearly bought it over 30 days ago as I had yet to find the receipt for the CPU. It was a pretty expensive CPU, so I was hoping that management would make an exception and let him exchange it. So I kept looking for his receipt for the CPU. He didn't have a lot of transactions, so I figured I could just brute force it and go through them one at a time, and yet I couldn't find it. It wasn't on any of his receipts. Me. I'm not finding the CPU under your account. Is there another name it could be under? Kid. We could try my dad's. His name is Dad. I look up his name and no account shows up. Me. Uh, there's no account under your father's name. Oh, he doesn't have an account. I'm the only one who shops here. It's at this point that I realize that I'm dealing with a teen who is slightly stupider than your average teenager. However, I keep my composure and keep moving forward. I try not to treat people differently based on their intelligence. In a last ditch effort, I check the transactions based on the CPU serial number. We have to manually attach transactions to accounts and sometimes the cashiers neglect to do that for any number of reasons. However, when I scanned the serial number, nothing popped up. That was weird. Me. Did you buy this at this location or a different location? Different location. I admit, I should have asked that sooner so I could have pulled up the remote search window from the get-go. However, when I pulled it up, it showed that he had never made any purchase at any of our other locations. He had only ever shopped at my store's location. Me, thinking that it could be a glitch in my system and hoping that I could access the more complete central server database. Which computer store location did you buy this from? Oh, I didn't buy this from computer store. I bought this from Amazon. I just looked at him silently. I didn't know how I got to this point. Why did he think we would take his CPU that he bought from Amazon? So I asked, me, why are you trying to get a refund for a product you didn't even buy from here? What do you mean? You didn't give us the money for this. You gave it to Amazon. Therefore, we don't have money to give back to you. That's Amazon. So, I want my money back. Your money isn't here. Your money is at Amazon. If you want your money, you need to go to Amazon. So you can't take care of it? 
No, you didn't give us money for that CPU. That CPU has no monetary value here that I can give back to you. Can I exchange it? I'm afraid not. We don't do trade-ins. I assumed he was talking about a trade-in. No, I want to exchange it. Internally, I'm banging my head against a wall. How could a teen not understand the concept that a return can only go back to where he originally bought it from? Me. In order to do an exchange, you would have needed to buy the product here or at one of our other locations, but you didn't. You bought it at Amazon. There's nothing here that I can do for you. You need to send this back to Amazon. So, you're not going to help me? No. At this point, he leaves, and I'm relieved that he eventually understood. Or so I thought, because not even a minute later, he comes back with my manager. He wouldn't let me return this and was mean to me. I want a refund. Manager, I'm sorry about that, sir. Do you have the receipt? No, but I bought it last month on Amazon. I kid you not. That's what he said. Manager, why would I give you money for something that you didn't even buy from us? Are you saying you won't give me a refund? Manager, there is no refund to give and nothing I can do for you. The teen then storms off to a salesman and says to them, They were mean to me, called me names, and won't give me a refund for my item. Salesman, that's not my department. It's their decision when it comes to refunds. The teen then storms off and tries this routine over and over again, each time getting more and more upset over the next 20 minutes until he is quite literally ugly crying to the store's general manager about how horrible everyone there was to him and how we won't give him a refund for his CPU. The general manager then asked him to wait and came to me. General manager, why won't you give him a refund for his CPU? At this point, I don't really care how old he is. Me, he didn't buy it from here. He bought it from Amazon. Ask him. The general manager did just that. When he heard that the team did, in fact, buy the CPU from Amazon, the general manager essentially asked him why he thought that we had take it and give him a refund. The team said someone in the repairs department said that we had take care of him. This turned out to be a misunderstanding or a lie, as the technician was only saying that I was the one who handled returns, not that I'd definitely, for sure, give him a refund. Eventually, the kid left, tears in his eyes and without a refund. He later left me a survey review that I made fun of him, threw his items on the floor, and refused to give him a refund. We have cameras. My general manager had that review dismissed. It's insanely annoying to get a survey review dismissed so it shows just how ridiculous the general manager thought this situation was. Neighbor threatens to sue me. I played a reverse Uno. I recently moved into a neighborhood in Michigan. One of my neighbors, we'll call him Bob, came over to introduce himself. He told me that he has a special needs son that lives with him. The son is in his 30s with significant mental disabilities. Bob first asked if I would mind keeping dangerous things out of my yard, like not leaving chainsaws or something unattended. That's pretty reasonable. But then he proceeded to tell me that I needed to keep my garage door down at all times or I had to lock up anything dangerous if I wanted to keep them up, like all gasoline, sharp tools, fertilizers, etc. Oh, also any beer or other drinks, like in my garage fridge. I also need to keep my door locked at all times or else his son may wander into my house. Then Bob tells me that now that I've been warned, if his son gets into anything, I'm now liable to be sued by him. And I told Bob in no uncertain terms that he was to control his kid. And if that his kid came into my house and broke stuff, I'd absolutely sue him and he'd absolutely pay. Later, I met the other neighbors and recounted this tale. They all got the same lecture from Bob when they moved in and they just said, okay, Bob, and ignored it. They all think I handled it wrong and that I should have just let Bob think that everything was good. They think I'm being a jerk to Bob by not letting him believe he didn't have anything to worry about. Not the jerk. That kid is Bob's responsibility, not yours. I will suggest putting up no trespassing signs and cameras. I would go a step further and send Bob and his son an official notice of trespass. I'd also inform Bob that I'd be contacting the authorities should his son be wandering alone without a caretaker. That's not good for the son's safety, especially considering he looks like an adult and strangers will react as such. Not the jerk, OP. Am I the jerk for firing the babysitter for being a bad influence? My wife and I hired a babysitter, Adeline, who's 18, for our kids who are 8 months, 2, 4, 5, and 7 a few months ago. Adeline is great with our kids and she's the only babysitter that can handle so many kids. 
A couple problems are that she's constantly late. It's usually no more than 5 minutes. She has been 10 and even 15 minutes late, however, but it's still irritating. Another thing is, after she gets everyone asleep, she spends the rest of the night on her phone or laptop. She never cleans up in the playroom because she claims it's always messy and she doesn't know where anything goes and will only clean up what she did with the kids. For example, Adeline did an art project with my older three kids and cleaned the counters and the floor after that art project, but she didn't pick up the toys that were in the living room or do the dishes. Another problem is that her outfits. I've asked my wife to talk to her about it, but she refused, even though she admitted that she agreed about Adeline's clothes. My parents are in town and they wanted to take the kids on a walk. While on the walk, they saw Adeline on a run wearing an outfit that barely covered anything. Everyone saw her and my kids talked about it for days. My five-year-old has also been talking about how pretty she is and that he's going to marry her when he gets older, which is completely unacceptable. I decided to fire her because of the reasons I listed above. When I told my wife, she started screaming at me because she thinks Adeline is a great babysitter and is reasonably priced. I told her Adeline is a bad influence and I don't want her around my kids, but she's refusing to speak to me until I call Adeline back and offer her job back. She even wants me to offer her a raise if she says no. Am I the jerk for firing the babysitter for being a bad influence? I cannot stop laughing. So much you're the jerk. If you want someone to clean your home, that is a separate service for which you must appropriately pay. From what your wife said, you're already underpaying the babysitter, so I'm sure your wife is fine with her being a few minutes late. You're already getting a great bargain. I'm sorry you're such a lazy slob that you don't clean your own house. I'm thinking it's best for Adeline that she no longer works for you. You're clearly a creep and it's not safe for her there. Stepsister destroyed my books, gets her trip canceled. I'm 16, female. My dad married my stepmom two years ago. She has a daughter who's 16 called Bianca. Bianca and I don't like each other. She thinks I'm a spoiled brat and that I have a princess complex because both my parents came from money and I always get what I want. This is by no means true at all. While my parents bought me lots of things, I have a part-time job and keep my grades up to earn everything I ask for. One of the things I love the most are books. Fantasy, romance, crime, mystery, I love them all. My mom and I share this hobby, so we're always buying books and reading them together. I also have a Nintendo Switch and a TV in my room. Aside from my laptop and my phone, those are my most prized possessions. My sister is always asking to borrow my things, clothes, makeup, my Switch, or my books. I let her use the first three because I don't really care, but when it comes to my books, I don't let anybody else have them. A few weeks ago, she came and asked me to take one or two because she saw the guy she likes reading The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, and I happen to have that book, though I've still yet to read it. I said no, and we had a discussion because I was so spoiled to share. She asked again by dinner, and I said no. Then she asked by breakfast and tried to get my dad and stepmom in. Both of them agreed with me. I sent her a few links of the book on discount, and I thought that was it. But three days ago, when I came back from my mom's house, I found seven of my books, including the one she wanted, ripped to pieces, some big chunks of my wallpaper missing, and a few posters on the floor all destroyed. It was no mystery. As soon as I told my dad and stepmom, they knew it was her and grounded her. She was supposed to go to LA in June for her birthday, but her mom said she wasn't going to be paying for it, and since her dad won't either, he's a deadbeat, then she'll pretty much just miss it, since some for the money will be mine to replace all the things she destroyed, and the rest will be kept as punishment. She's now losing it on me and calling me every name under the sun because I ruined her trip and the guy has been talking to another girl. You know you're not the jerk. Your stepmom sounds awesome, considering she's making her daughter face consequences for her behavior instead of enabling it. OP. I was confident I was not the jerk, but some of my friends said that I went too far for some books because I can always replace them and that it was not that big of a deal compared to her trip because that was for her birthday. No, they're wrong. It doesn't matter what the items were. That's irrelevant. She destroyed things that didn't belong to her and now she's facing the consequences. Not only that, but they were destroyed deliberately to hurt OP. Her stepsister likely needs counseling on better anger resolution.
you didn't go too far. I don't think it was mentioned, but I have a feeling that you weren't the one who decided this punishment. You just had your property destroyed. It was your father and stepmother who made this decision. It is completely possible that even if you told your parents that she didn't have to replace it, they still wouldn't allow her to go because she did something awful and they have to discipline her to help her realize that she did wrong and to help ensure she doesn't do this again. Next time, remind your friends of this. Let them know that you didn't decide the punishment and if they feel you just shouldn't have said anything after your room was destroyed, if they say you shouldn't have let your parents know and let your sister get away with doing this, then you may want to think deeper into those friendships. Not the jerk. You've done nothing wrong in this and neither have your parents, in my opinion. I called roadside assistance today. Note that I am a physically capable adult male. Mildly relevant. I blew out a tire while driving this afternoon. Pulled off the busy road to a side street to assess the damage and start working on repairing the flat with the spare from the trunk. It turned out that the lug wrench provided in this particular car was absolutely tiny and thus provided very little leverage. Try as I might, I only managed to loosen one of the five lug nuts holding the tire on. No problem, I thought, as I have roadside assistance coverage on my auto insurance. A short call later, my insurance has dispatched a local service provider and I receive a text stating that Daryl from the local provider will be arriving at my location by 2.34 p.m. That's less than a half hour wait, so I'm pretty happy. At 2.33 p.m., a van approaches. The driver waves at me and pulls over. Driver immediately hops out with a toolkit in hand. We exchange brief pleasantries and I explain my problem. Driver smiles and tells me the same thing happened to him last month and says not to worry about it. He takes out a proper wrench. I hand him the jack and spare and he has my car back in operation in about 6 minutes flat. It was at this point when the conversation got a bit muddled. I asked him if he needs anything from me, like a signature, to ensure he gets paid. He responds that no money is necessary. I try to clarify my question and explain that I have roadside assistance on my policy and that my insurer got him dispatched to me and that I think they will pay his employer for the service call. His response? Oh, no one dispatched me. I was just driving by and thought you could use some help. So you're not Daryl? Nope. Brian, I can't believe that I handed this guy my jack and just watched him crank up my car while lying on the frozen pavement. I don't even remember how many times I apologized. Guy wouldn't even let me hand him some cash. He just left in full cheer and told me to pay it forward. Aftermath, I waited another 10 minutes for Daryl but gave up and left after finding his employer's phone number and canceling the help request. My insurer had been sending me automated texts all day along the lines of, has your service provider arrived yet? Reply Y if yes, N if no. Has your service been completed yet? And how likely are you to recommend this service provider from 1 to 10? I can't figure out how to respond in such a way that no one gets in trouble or over or underpaid. Anyways, thanks Brian. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay more for a salon service than initially quoted? I was visiting LA and booked a full head of highlights, $500, with a well-known colorist. Yes, it's pricey, but hey, when in Rome. I was quoted $500 and 3 hours when I booked the appointment online. Then the series of events went like this. I get to the appointment on time. I work remotely and took the day off to make this work. They inform me that they may not have the supplies to color my hair, but they are waiting for a delivery. We start the appointment 30 minutes late. I'm irritated, but at this point, I'm just happy to not have to reschedule. I tell the colorist I want to go as blonde as possible. For context, I have two-month grown-out golden blonde, professionally done highlights. My hair is not thick, curly, or long. I've been told my hair is fine, but I have a lot of it. We make a game plan. She says she can't get me platinum today as it could damage, but we'll get as close as we can. She and her assistant go through foiling my hair. I've been getting salon highlights for about 20 years. From what I can tell, I'm getting a full head of highlights. At times, she stops to help other clients and comes back to me. At this point, I realize I'm going to be there all day. It's fine. After the hair is processed, they do a treatment in the shampoo bowl. I think it was a conditioning treatment. I wait another 30 minutes while that sits, followed by a gloss, sitting another 10 minutes, shampoo and blowout. I'm there for 5 hours. Annoyed but didn't say anything and just happy to be done. I'm happy about the result. She mentions that she's surprised how much my hair lifted 
but it's likely because it's in good condition. I pay the $500 with my card on file and tip 20% in cash. She tells me when I'm back in LA to book again and she can get me lighter. Great. I decide not to book that day just so I can see how it looks over the next few weeks. I leave excited with my new hair. 20 minutes later, I have a voicemail from the salon saying they undercharged me. The price wasn't $500. It's actually $1,000 for the service I had. I'm shocked. I freeze my credit card so they're unable to charge anything else. They start texting me saying that the colorist was so busy she forgot to mention it to the front desk. They keep calling. I'm annoyed now since we never discussed a price increase, never mind two times what was originally quoted. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay? I had intended to sleep on it and just message them back in the morning with feedback on how this is bad business, but they can charge my card. But now I really don't want to pay it. It would have been bad enough had they tried to charge me $1,000 when checking out, but I was already done at this point. Also, if it was $100 more or something, sure, whatever, mistakes happen, but double the initial price? And I wasted my whole day off there, most of it waiting around for color to process. As far as I know, it wasn't more work for her. Not the jerk. They didn't tell you before the service. They didn't tell you after the service. They didn't even tell you while you were still there. They only caught it after they told you everything was done. They did it once they realized she's a tourist. You tend to get upcharged when they know you won't be back, but this is very shady. Sorry, but they shouldn't have told her after the service. If they didn't tell her beforehand, they had no right to the upcharge. A professional should be able to accurately quote their services once you're in the chair. Price can be adjusted at that point once they know what they're up against. Total jerk move. Not the jerk. I've had a stylist make comments while coloring my hair that it was taking more bleach and more dye than expected. My hair was very short and just drinking the product. She had to get someone else who didn't have gloves covered in product already to open more things for both the bleach and the dye. The charge when the service was done was higher than originally quoted, but it wasn't fully double and I already knew the service took more product than was in the original quote. OP is not the jerk. That salon is trying to commit theft if they're changing the price that late and just trying to charge the card anyway. If they at least said it while OP was still at the salon, they could have discussed and possibly met in the middle, but there is no excusing trying to charge that much extra after OP left. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you pay the full price they're asking for or not? Please let us know. I'd leave them more bad reviews online than they can imagine. Would I be the jerk if I let my uncle report my car as stolen? I'm 18, female. My parents divorced when I was six. My mom remarried my stepdad, Oscar, while my dad remained single. I have two step-siblings who are 21 and 19 and one half-brother who's eight from my mom's side. My dad didn't have any more kids. He was an active role in my life though. He traveled a lot, but we would always call and he'd visit me as soon as he got back. I could spend months in his house since he remained close to us, so I had equal access to my schools whenever it was his or my mom's custody time. Oscar doesn't like my paternal family at all, but it sucks. He always tried to boss me around, telling me that while I live at his house, he was my dad and I had to obey him. He tried to take away a bunch of the things my dad gave me, toys, clothes, tech, because I had to share with his kids. He tried to force a relationship, but I never cared. Well, my dad passed a year ago, and just a month or two before that, he had bought a brand new car. Since I'm his only kid, I was left pretty much everything. My uncle, 25 male, brought me a few things after the funeral, including the car, and told me that I should learn how to drive. He couldn't teach me before. He had to be away for college. I couldn't do it, and a few months ago, I started to notice my car moved. I thought it was odd because Oscar has his own, but it turns out that he had been using it because he likes it. I said that he never asked for my permission and that he couldn't just use my things, but he laughed in my face and said that I was a child and he didn't need my permission and that after all these years, I owed him. I called my uncle crying and he told me to give him a call when Oscar took the car so he could report it as stolen. But I'm scared. Would I be the jerk if I let my uncle do it? I don't think my stepdad has any intentions to give my car back. Not the jerk. Your stepdad is a bully and your mom sucks for allowing his behavior. You don't owe him anything and you should let your uncle call the police, otherwise he'll keep doing this to you. OP. Yeah, she really sucks. 
She said we could swap cars, but my dad's is a 2022 and my stepdad's is a 2006 at best. It's not her car to swap, it's yours. If you don't want to swap, then tough crap for everyone else. Not the jerk, sorry to hear about your situation and I hope it improves. If you're legally an adult, then it is stolen property. Absolutely call the police and see if you can move in with your uncle. You're not the jerk at all. Please don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. I'm rooting for you. Or ask your uncle to come around and take your car back to his place to look after it for you until you can drive it. Or just hide the keys from your family. I strongly suspect stepdad will damage the car out of spite if he can't drive it. It needs to be moved out of his reach. Lady thought I worked at the museum, but I'm 10. When I was a kid, I used to really be into dinosaurs, like really into them, knowing almost everything about my favorite ones and had hopes of becoming a paleontologist. And yes, Jurassic Park, the first film, is still one of my favorite movies, right next to The Ballad of Big Al. Yep, I'm a nerd. Anyway, when I was a kid, we went to visit my grandparents in another state and grandma mentioned that a new museum had just opened near their city. And mom and dad thought, why not? I was excited. My sister was okay with it since we were going to her favorite shop afterward. Now keep in mind, I'm 10, over 5 feet and a bit baby faced still. Also, the museum employees were in safari style clothes. I remember that well because I thought they looked cool and like real paleontologists. I don't remember what I was wearing, but mom said they were just plain clothes. The museum was awesome. They had real skeletons behind a painted version of the dinosaur on the wall and loads of information on each fossil and skeleton. I stood besides this kid younger than me and he was confused about this one pterosaur skeleton above us and he asked his mom what that bird was. When she didn't know, I'd tell him all about the little pterosaur and what they liked to eat, that they had feathers, their wing membrane being similar to bats, etc. You would have thought that I had told him all the secrets of the world with how wide his eyes were and this look of awe plastered on his face. He and I chatted for a long time as we walked around the museum and I answered all the questions he had about them. After a while, the mom said, Wow, you know these creatures well. Thank you for taking the time to give us a tour. I smiled before mom called me over and we went into the shop to look at the dinosaur stuff they had. I vaguely remember this, but mom helped to fill me in. She has a sharper memory than I do. According to mom, the lady was checking out with her son and she started talking about me and how well I knew all about my job, saying that her son had so much fun and asked the manager if they could give me a raise. The cashier asks who I was and after she described me, the cashier was confused. That's when mom stepped in and explained that I don't work there since I'm 10, but that I just love dinosaurs and love talking about them to anyone who wants to hear. The lady seemed embarrassed but she was thankful to me nonetheless and asked my mom to tell me that for her. I was busy looking through the toys and wasn't listening to them. Her son waved goodbye to me as they walked out and I waved back. Mom told me how proud she was and that I made that boy's day. I left with a big smile and a stuffed velociraptor to commemorate the occasion. So sorry to anyone who was expecting a crazy lady story, but I thought a wholesome one about a simple mistake leading to a fun day and making someone happy would have been better. Am I the jerk for taking my babies on the quiet carriage for a train ride? Me and my twins, who are nine months, were traveling to see family and went via train. I lined the trip up with their nap schedule, so by the time we arrived at the station, they were asleep in their stroller. I first entered a normal carriage, but there were kids screaming, loud talking, music playing with no headphones, etc. I didn't want to deal with that for the three hour ride or risk the babies waking up, so I moved to the next carriage, which happened to be a quiet carriage. There were maybe 10 people in this carriage, and I could tell they weren't happy seeing the babies. No blame, I understand their concern. I sat in the seats closest to the doors, so if the babies woke up, I could leave. One lady in particular, three rows up, was sending me death glares, but I just settled in and ignored her. She came up to me before we'd even departed and told me it was a quiet carriage. I told her I knew and would move if we made any noise. She tried telling me kids weren't allowed in these carriages, not true, but I just repeated what I said early and smiled until she walked away. About an hour into the ride, one of the babies makes a noise in their sleep. It lasted a second and was quieter than if someone were to have sneezed, coughed, etc., which had happened, yet I didn't say anything, nor did anyone else. The lady from earlier bolted right up, came up to me, and told me I had to go. 
She said I had violated the quiet carriage noises and made an attempt to grab my stroller. I hit her hand away, told her don't touch my stroller that my two kids were in, and told her to leave us alone. I told her that her water bottle filled with ice was making more noises than I was, and her scolding at me right now was more of a distraction. She left and came back with a train worker because I was apparently violating the quiet car rules. At this stage, my babies were awake, yet still not crying or fussing. The worker told the lady I wasn't breaking any rules and to go back to her seat. The rest of the trip went as planned, no noises from the babies. When I told my family this interaction, most told me that it was obvious kids aren't supposed to be in that carriage and I should have left. I thought it was fine since they were quiet, it wasn't an official rule or even suggested. Am I the jerk? Workplace gets robbed for thousands of pounds of stock after new boss tells me I'm not the supervisor and I must comply with my contract. Bit of background to this. So around 10 years ago, I worked for a small independent construction supply store. We sold various things from measuring tapes to power drills, plumbing fittings to sheet timber and paint to roof tiles. I had been there for three years at this point and got on well with the whole team. There were around 12 employees in total and everyone helped everyone. The atmosphere was always happy and cheerful. The boss, let's call him Jeff, was a star. I loved him. He was laid back as heck and we had a lot of mutual interests, sports teams, bands, movies, etc. He would bring in stacks of donuts every Friday for the team. Jeff was just the best boss ever. We had this supervisor, Lynn, who had been with the company a good while. Lynn would come in early and open up in the morning before anyone else arrived and would stay back at night to lock up and close the gates. When Lynn left the company to move to his wife's home country about two years into my being there, I agreed with Jeff that I would take over from Lynn for regards to opening in the morning and closing at night. The verbal agreement with Jeff and HR slash payroll was that I was not promoted as supervisor. I was happy with that as I didn't want the extra hassle. Plus, the soup had to work every third Saturday. Where I didn't, Jeff took on the extra duties that went with the role. But I was to be paid an extra two hours per day for the added duties in the morning and at night. Things were normal for a good while, until Jeff went on long-term sick leave. He was a huge loss in and around the place, and naturally, we were all worried about him. I visited him regularly while he was absent and kept him up to date with the goings-on and gossip. In the meantime, the firm hired a temporary replacement manager, Rick the Jerk, to fill in for Jeff. This guy was a complete jerk, of the highest order. No one liked him, he was smug and arrogant, he would say crude things to us and had this top dog, tough guy attitude, mess with me at your peril kind of guy. It was to the point where the donuts on a Friday were ordered to be stopped. Signs up, the lot. With the extra OT money, I had taken over the buying of the Friday donuts as to keep morale high. But no, it had to stop. Soon enough, Rick was assessing the timesheets and noticed my daily two hours overtime claim. He called me in to speak about it and I informed him that as per the agreement with Jeff and HR slash payroll, he asked if I had it in writing and I said no. It was a verbal agreement that people from HR slash payroll would back me up on. Rick was his typical arrogant smarty self and told me, I don't give a hoot what you have agreed. It ain't in writing, so you ain't getting the OT. I know it doesn't take two hours per day to lock and unlock a door or two. I have good reason to write you up for falsifying timesheets for this. It stops now. You work your stated hours and you do only the stated duties as per your contract. Thing is, the silly jerk confirmed what he said to me by way of an email, just so I had it in writing, so I was perfectly clear as to what my place in the company was. Fine by me, Rick. That evening, I hung the shop keys in the key cabinet and went to wash up. I wasn't the last out, but I left at 5.05, instead of my usual 5.45 or thereabouts. I walked out while all the lights were left on, the doors were unlocked, and the gates were left open. Even the roller shutter door in the warehouse was left half open. The next morning I arrived a little after 7.15 instead of my usual 6.30. Some colleagues had already turned up by this point. The place had been done over good style. All the power tools were gone. Loads of wood stock gone. Pipes all gone. Paint all gone. It had been ransacked good and proper. An estimated 30,000 to 40,000 pounds of stock was gone. And as the store was now a crime scene, we were all sent home until further notice. 
We all had to give statements to the police, and a few days later, I was called into a meeting with HR and Rick the Jerk. I was well aware of what was coming and was well prepared. He went to town on me. He accused me of being in on it as I was the only key holder. I wasn't, and that I was facing years in prison. I sat in silence as he fired me six times in that meeting. Dereliction of duties. Breach of a verbal contract. Apparently that's a thing. The lot. He was coming after me like wildfire because I had failed to ensure that the building was secured, as was the ongoing agreement put in place by my previous boss. After what seemed like forever having this irate lunatic scream at me, I asked HR if I could log into my emails on her computer. Surprisingly, Sarah agreed. Imagine the absolute crap-eating grin as I pulled up the three-day-old email from Rick, reminding me of our conversation and confirming that I was to stick to the duties and times as stated in my contract, and smugly and innocently told Sarah, I just did what my boss told me to do. And the best part was the sheer horror on Rick's face when I pulled out five printouts of that email and handed them to him and said, I have more of these at home just in case you feel like destroying these ones and removing emails from the system. Now, is there anything else? Can I get back to work or am I still fired? Rick resigned that day. Update. Wow, so much activity on this post. For all those who gave me awards, thank you so much, you magnificent people. One comment in particular to address where someone said I purposefully left the building vulnerable to thieves. I did not. I had no idea the building was going to be left open. I left in good spirits as I was on my way to a football game, soccer, that evening and was happy that I would be able to leave earlier and would be able to park closer to the stadium. It's the simple things, eh? I complied with a direct verbal and written order from my supervisor. As we officially didn't have a supervisor after Lynn left, I took on the opening and closing duties as agreed with Jeff. I was told to stop this by Rick, which I did. On the evening in question, I was not the last one to leave and the others who left after me assumed I was still inside somewhere as I was always last out prior to this happening. They had no reason to think I wasn't going to be locking up as usual. I didn't ask Rick who would be locking up at night from now on because, well, he wasn't a guy with whom I wanted to spend any more time or converse with any more than was absolutely necessary. I thought he would have done it and claimed the extra two hours a day of OT for himself. He was that kind of guy. He failed to put in place any directive to anyone in terms of locking up at night. The incident was, in my opinion, entirely his fault. As for the person slash people who suggested Rick could have been in on it, the police tracked down who was responsible and after a few days there were no connections discovered to anyone in the company. Yeah, Rick was a jerk, but I honestly don't think he would have done something that could get him jail time. One of the guys arrested and charged admitted it and said it was an opportunist deal. They were driving around and spotted the lights on and no cars in the car park, so took the chance and got away with loads of equipment and materials total of three people jailed for a couple of years each. The business was located fairly close to one of the shadier parts of town, not the worst area, but certainly not Beverly Hills. Jeff had insurance to cover every possibility, including loss, fire, or theft as a direct result of non-criminal mismanagement, so the only cost to the company was a slightly higher insurance premium for the next couple of years. Jeff returned to work two months after the incident, 2011 and two of us were promoted into the supervisor and general manager roles. I was the new, official soup, so got a raise as well as the OT for opening and locking up. In 2013, Jeff sold out to a huge national building supplies firm and retired. He now plays golf four times a week and keeps good health. I left in 2015 due to the family feel of the business no longer being there, and the atmosphere was just different. Not bad in any way, just different. It wasn't the same and I wanted a new challenge. I still see Jeff from time to time and we remain good friends. Jeff's construction supplies is the only place I have ever worked where I kept in touch with colleagues since leaving. I saw Rick in a supermarket grocery store in a neighboring town, maybe 18 months or so ago. We made eye contact and I smiled at him, but he never acknowledged me. I don't know what he's up to these days, nor do I particularly care. Karen Tattoo Artist hid her initials in my tattoo. I went to a tattoo shop in my area with a photo of the tattoo I wanted. It was one my dad had gotten to honor my past grandfather, whose father also had it. But the point is, it was important to me that the tattoo looked exactly as it did in the photo. I get to the shop, I explain everything. I pay, get the tattoo, and we're done. I think it looks awesome, everything is great. 
until a few weeks later when I show my great-grandmother the tattoo. She's static, grabs my arm to look at it and compliment it, then asks, who's AJ? I ask her what she means and she points out that my tattoo has the initials A and J or maybe T and they were hidden in the tattoo. I'm instantly upset as my artist's name is Alice Trevor. She tries to assure me it's no big deal if I hadn't noticed it until now, but I still reached out to the artist sort of irritated. They told me the style of art I got is called traditional and it's pretty traditional for all artists who do that style to do it. I demanded a partial refund and they refused, so I complained to the owner who made the artist give me a full refund. Now the artist is running a full smear campaign, talking about moving shops and all kinds of crap. My sister says I'm the jerk for pushing the issue, but I feel like, at the end of the day, I told you exactly what I wanted and you didn't do that. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, and I would even consider suing. They kind of branded you with their initials, and they should get fired. The artist had no right to hide their initials on your skin without your consent. I would be highly upset if it was done to me. Especially since it sounds like OP told the artist it needs to be exact and they still put their initials in anyway. You get permission before you do something that's permanent. After all, who wants a random person's initials in their tattoo? Normally, you get a stencil put on first, which you approve. So, potentially, the initials were in the stencil and OP didn't notice or the artist freehanded it. Crappy move for definite. If someone asks about my tattoos, I always give the artist's name, even if I wasn't asked. Or, you don't need to put your signature on me. Edit. I should say, I'm not condoning this at all. It's a horrible thing for an artist to do. I'm just providing some extra context and perspective. It doesn't matter whether or not it was on the stencil, honestly. It's like the surgeon who was branding his initials on organs. Nobody can see it, but it still doesn't really matter. They didn't give permission, and the fact you concealed it suggests you know they wouldn't have given permission. I sincerely doubt, but it was on the stencil, will hold up in court. It's just a straight-up psychopathic power play. Nothing more. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the tattoo artist? Please let us know. You should show them the K I tattooed on you when you were asleep, Red Boy. Not allowed a day off until you're sick? Fine, I'm sick. I worked for a grocery store in Australia for close to a decade. It wasn't terrible, and management treated us with respect for my first few years there. If someone couldn't make a shift, they'd work with us to find a replacement. We were rarely short-staffed, so worst-case scenario, things would still run relatively smoothly, even if we were missing a few on a given day. Fast forward a few years. The good manager retires, and an assistant manager from a nearby store is promoted to managing this store. Let's call him Brad for the sake of this story. Brad approached the position with an ego, treating this store as his to fix, even though things had been running quite smoothly for years before he was in the picture. Part of his vision of fixing the store was stricter adherence to company-wide guidelines in terms of staffing numbers and leave requests. For example, the amount of staff to be rostered on is determined by the number of customers through our doors each day. Staff who were actually experienced at this location knew we needed more than what the company guidelines specified to be able to function effectively. Within the first month of Brad's tenure at this store, hours are being cut dramatically across the store causing chaos as nobody was used to the added workload. When confronted about this by other members of management, he immediately dismisses them, quoting, company guidelines. During the same period of time, staff began to notice that any request for leave was being instantly denied by Brad. Now the company guideline is to give at least two weeks notice if you know you'll need a day off, but it goes without saying, sometimes friends or family will make last minute plans you'd like to attend, or you can't work a shift due to compassionate reasons. Prior to Brad, if you needed some time off, it was as simple as honestly communicating your situation with our manager. Almost always, we're able to come up with a solution and taking a day off was never a big deal. Keep in mind, these guidelines are just that, guidelines, not strict rules that must be enforced. Store managers are given a rather loose collar from higher management. As long as things are running smoothly and staff are happy, upper management will usually take a rather hands-off approach. They won't micromanage each individual store, ensuring every little corporate guideline is being adhered to, unless there are obvious issues requiring their attention. So now Brad's about a month into his position. We are short-staffed throughout the store. Everyone is stressed. 
Requests for leave are being denied due to the lack of staff that Brad caused in the first place. Brad quotes company policy each and every time he does this. He won't even allow us to organize someone else to cover shift as it's too much paperwork. It's a Saturday and I'm due to work my regular shift that same night. I get a call from a friend with a spare ticket to see my favorite artist sold out show. I want to go and I've spoken to a colleague who's willing to cover my shift so I'm not doing over my team. I call the store and I speak to Brad, tell him the situation and that I have someone to cover said shift. Brad predictably gives me the same response that he's given everyone else. Sorry, as per grocery store X staffing policy, you must give two weeks notice for any time off. It doesn't matter if someone else is willing to take the shift. Cue malicious compliance. For a manager who's so into following rules, I was surprised to discover that he never took into account the grocery store's sick leave policy. Staff are entitled to paid sick leave for a day without the requirement of a doctor's note. So if you take two days or more off consecutively, then you need a medical certificate. I call back an hour after my initial call. This time I tell Brad that I've come down with the most terrible headache and that there is no way I can work that night. He doesn't even reply to me. I can faintly hear him angrily mumble that he'll have to call in a last minute replacement before hanging up. It didn't take long for staff to catch on to this loophole. Staff needing time off with less than two weeks notice would no longer bring it to their manager's attention immediately, instead opting to call in sick the day of each time. Obviously, this ensured further chaos in terms of lack of staff, a problem I never experienced in my near decade at the store. Brad quit after about a month and a half of being manager. Replacing him was the old assistant manager that had been at this location for several years at this point. It took a while to reverse the damage Brad had caused, but things got back to normal with someone who actually knew how to run the store at the helm. Please leave the cops out of it. Okay, another Pops story. I'm back once again with a story about my grandfather, Pops. Pops was a decent man. He was the kind of guy that would go out of his way to help someone without question. During the months between April and November, my little hometown would often get people just passing through waiting for a bus heading towards Alberta and British Columbia. Sometimes people down on their luck just trying to find a better life. Pops would often head into town and if there was someone new, he would strike up a conversation to make sure they were okay. If they were down on their luck, Pops would offer them a hot meal and work for a few months so they could be sent off with some money. If they didn't want work and were going east, he would throw them $100 just to make sure they were good. This was just the kind of man he was. It only ever backfired one time. He offered a guy two months of work. Pop would send him off with a few thousand, this is back in the 70s, and three hot meals a day, and a warm bed to rest his head. Well, that arrangement worked well, and at the end of the two months, Pops handed him roughly $2,000. The guy had possible work out east, so a fine start for a new life. The guy was going to stay for a week and get the bus out to Alberta. Well, a few days before he was due to leave, Pops had been out in town and comes back to find his home ransacked. Guy tore through everything. One thing about Pops, he lived through the Great Depression, so he always had a backup if crap hit the fan. Pops had at least 40 one ounce gold coins hidden in the house at all times. The guy got his coins and legged it out of town. The bus came once a week on a Saturday. Pops was so upset. Pops was good to this guy, gave him work and food money. Well, Pops jumped in his truck, right to town, got his brother and a weapon. So Pops and his brother took off down to the diner near the entrance of town and asked if they had seen the guy go past. Sure enough, someone had spotted him legging it down the highway. Well, Pops and his brother managed to catch up to him and told the guy to drop his stuff and a long speech about his betrayal. Pops got his stuff back and Pops said to the guy, don't worry, you ain't getting hurt, but you're going right to the law. The guy just begs and pleaded to not get the police involved. At that, Pop's brother says something into Pop's ear and Pop smiles, looks over to the guy and says, okay, we're going to let it go. No law, you're free to go. So the guy thinks he's in the clear and is getting ready to take off. Well, Pop said, hey, 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 we said no law. Don't mean you get off scot-free. Pops took everything besides his boots. They took his bag, his wallet, every bit of clothing he had. They complied no law. Oh, and don't worry, Pops didn't keep his crap. Pops told him there's no hard feelings. You can even have all your stuff back. 
It's all going to be waiting for you at the pub back in town. And that's exactly what happened. Pops went to the pub, had a few drinks, it took several hours, but eventually the guy made it to the pub, head hanging in shame. And from what Pops said, more than one person came out of their houses to point and laugh. The pub was packed. Word gets out quickly in a small town. Well, the guy got his crap and asked if he could stay in town. They ran him right out of town, made him walk the eight-hour walk to the next town. He got back all his crap, his money and clothing, as Pop said the guy was a crook, but he did the work. Am I the jerk for not acting happy when I found out my wife was pregnant? Okay, so I, male 28, have been married to my wife, Caroline, female 28, for a year. Everything has been going relatively smoothly. We're doing well and are generally on the same page about our plans. We both do very well for ourselves financially and we have a solid amount saved so far. Last week, Caroline came to me and she told me that she was pregnant. I had so many emotions in the moment. One, I was scared about whether we are financially and emotionally ready to raise a baby. Two, I was kind of happy, obviously, I'm going to be a dad. Three, I was concerned about what this was going to do for our future plans education-wise since we're both planning on going to graduate school soon. In the moment, I kinda acted more shocked than happy. I started asking a lot of questions and asked her what her plans were and what were the next steps she wanted to take. I was literally shaking in the moment. I kept prodding and asking questions and after a few minutes of this, she told me she expected me to be happy for us and walked out of the room. I want to be excited, but at the same time, I'm literally getting pounded with like 10 different emotions at the same time. Her mom called me and said I should just put it aside and act happy, and I told her straight up I'm freaking out. She started telling me that I'm acting immature and that I'm being a bad husband. I feel so terrible, but I also think it's natural to not have to act happy. Am I the jerk? Okay, I just want to clarify, I'm not a jerk like people are trying to make it seem. I mentioned asking about her career plans more from a financial standpoint. I want to be able to provide for our kid, and I wanted to know if she plans to work. It was obviously a stupid question in the moment, but I was nervous. Edit. Big update here. She was in the kitchen getting some water, and I just straight up walked up to her and hugged her. I told her I'm happy and that I want to do this together. I told her how much this means to me and that I'm 28, have my degree, have a stable job. I included this to reinforce we're stable enough to do this, and that I'm completely ready to commit to being a dad, and that I believe that she's ready to be a great mom too. She was emotional. Honestly felt like a movie scene, and it all just took five minutes. I filled up her cup with water and told her to relax. She's sleeping now, but I feel better. I'm happy, but I'm still nervous about everything. What her plans are? Way to make her feel in it alone. The moment your wife tells you she's pregnant isn't the moment to drill down into her detailed strategy for child rearing. You're the jerk. A gentle you're the jerk. I understand you were shocked, but if your account of the conversation is accurate, your wife probably felt like you were blaming her. You asked her what her plans were and what were the next steps she wanted to take. You both made this baby. It's about our plans and what we want to do, not her. Just remember, you're on the same team for future conversations and hopefully they'll go a bit better than this one. Congratulations. Not the jerk. You bring up legitimate, practical concerns on the matter. But your wife's not wrong to be disappointed by your reaction. She's probably having similar concerns and a little bit of support might have been more appropriate in the moment. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for the way he reacted or not? Please let us know. Financial plans can kind of go out the window once a baby arrives. Good luck, OP. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay for my niece's contact lens? My sister came to me and asked for $700 for my niece last year to have contact lenses for a year. They had financial difficulties and my niece really wanted them, but they couldn't afford them. I'm not rich, but I haven't visited them in years due to living in another country, so I've missed a few Christmases, so I agreed. I would cover her optometrist visit and contacts for the year. I sent her the money via e-transfer, expecting her to do all the legwork to get the contacts. Fast forward a few weeks. I was asking if she likes them, the contacts. She confirmed she does and doesn't elaborate. Finally, with travel restrictions lifting, I went to visit my family and friends. My sister lives in another city than everyone else, and it was a last-minute trip, so I didn't really warn her because I wasn't sure I could visit her. I couldn't get a hold of her, so I called her husband, who confirmed they were home. One of my friends canceled, so I rented a car and drove to the next state. She greeted me, but didn't want me to go inside. 
I was so confused, but luckily her husband saw me too and welcomed me in. I met the kids, their new dog, and saw my niece still had glasses on and asked if she gave up on the contacts because they were scratchy and drying. She looked at me like I had three heads and said that she never got contacts. My sister was looking very uncomfortable and I was so confused saying I sent some money so she could get contacts. Her husband looked at her and me for a minute before asking the kids to go up to their room. Turns out my sister used the money to bring home a dog she wanted during lockdown. She told her husband she found the dog and it was probably a runaway with no collar and chip, but in reality she paid for it. I was upset I got duped into giving her money for a dog they shouldn't have had, according to her husband, because they were having trouble covering the vet bills, but knowing she also paid for the dog with my money caused them to get into a fight in front of me. I walked out and was upset, but finished my trip. My sister called me a month ago to ask me for more money to pay for my niece's contacts for real this time, but I'm out of goodwill and told her to save up for it and she started crying, saying her husband is blaming her for wasting the money and she wanted to make it right by buying the contacts now. I told her to pick up some waitressing shifts to cover the cost. She was a waitress, now a stay-at-home mom, and she yelled at me for being the jerk for not being willing to pay for the contacts. Not the jerk. If her husband is upset with her wasting the money, hopefully he's a good enough person that he would be upset with her hassling her last victim to have a do-over. Let him know that she's trying to solve her marital problems by mooching even more off of you and that you've lost your goodwill and hope he understands that you won't be comfortable donating to either of them. Not the jerk. I'm floored by the audacity here. Tell her you already paid for the contacts and won't be doing it again. And from here on out, I wouldn't buy or send anything to your niece unless she's with you. Not the jerk. You know the old saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You owe your sister nothing. She owes you $700 and an apology for using the money other than what she told you for. She also owes her niece an apology if she made any promises about getting her contacts. Am I the jerk for not being as excited about my younger sister's dog adoption as I was about my older sister's new kid? I'm 32 years old, male, and I live across the country from the rest of my family. My older sister, Nina, is 36, and my younger sister, Jen, is 25. Last month, Nina gave birth to her first kid. When she went into labor, I booked the first ticket across the country to meet her new son. I took a week off work and spent the entire time helping her out where I could, catching up with family and looking for any excuse to hold her new baby. During this time, Jen was becoming visibly frustrated with the attention the baby was getting, and she went full passive-aggressive mode on me for the last few days of the trip. On the last day, I gave Nina $5,000 for the baby to use as she wishes. I know her and her husband aren't in the greatest situation financially, and she would never ask me for money, but I was happy to give it to her. A week later, I suddenly get a message directing me to Jen's Twitter. I ignored it at first because I don't use Twitter. Then I got a Skype message from her with a picture of a new puppy. I told her the dog was super cute and asked where she got it. Apparently she had saved it from a local pound. I congratulated her on her new dog and figured that that was that. During the next week, Jen kept getting more and more persistent about when I would visit again to see her new dog. I told her I wouldn't be doing so and so Jen linked me to her Amazon wishlist for new dog necessities. Since she doesn't work, it's not really any surprise that she would ask for someone to buy her things for her dog. I ignored it. Finally, Jen snapped and sent me a really long message about how much attention I gave to Nina for getting pregnant, how her dog means just as much to her as Nina's baby, and how I was such a jerk to give Nina $1,000. Apparently, word got to her that I gave Nina money, but luckily she misunderstood and thought it was only $1,000. Thank goodness for that. Jen is still refusing to talk to me, and our mother even says the least I could do is buy her a leash, but I don't want to encourage her behavior any further. Am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. If you need an Amazon wish list for your dog, you shouldn't be getting a dog. I'm sorry, but your younger sister is an entitled and spoiled brat. Tell her that it's a big difference between one becoming an uncle for the first time and someone else getting a dog that they quite frankly shouldn't be having if they don't have an income. Tell her that you will by no means fly across the country just to see a puppy because it's not comparable. Also, I'm child free by choice and I have two cats. My sister has a toddler. And no way do I think our parents should be giving my cats the same money and attention as they give to my niece. That's just ridiculous to say the least. Am I the jerk for not allowing my girlfriend's sister to move in and changing the locks? 
So, a really messy situation. I, 27 male, have been dating my girlfriend, Ashton, 26 female, for two years and we live in the house that I own. Ashton's finishing up her master's program, so I don't charge her rent. I pay for all the housing expenses and in return, she chips in on groceries, utilities, and some of the household chores. But I pay the lion's share of all household expenses. I'm cool with this situation till she graduates and we have always communicated well until now. Ashton has a hot mess of a sister named Anna, who's 28. Anna has burned most of her bridges with her family. She has two kids by two different dads, been married and divorced twice, hops from one sketchy boyfriend to another, always in and out of work, always complaining about her situation instead of actually doing anything to solve it. I gave up on her last year when she dated this loser who obviously didn't like kids, and she kept dating him against me and her sister's advice. Well, she moved into his place, and this Saturday we got a call that they were breaking up and she had nowhere to go this time. She hadn't been working and didn't have rent money. Ashton asked me if we could take them in. I said absolutely not. Her sister was a leech. Also, that I didn't want kids in my house. I work from home half the time and don't want three extra people in my space. Also, I don't want to get involved with her sister at all. I've supported her plenty over the last few years. Rides, babysitting, etc. And I'm done. My girlfriend didn't take this well and said she would help her sister if she could. I said fine, let me know where you take her and I'll bring by some food, but it won't be my house. My girlfriend tried saying it was her house too. I said when she started paying the mortgage, she can decide who lives here. So her sister tried calling me individually. I told her the same reasons and I told her I'd bring food by when she finds a place. I also gave her the number of multiple organizations that could help her. She got offended. Well, I was at work yesterday, sales, and I noticed on my ring camera Anna and her kids were unlocking my front door with a bag on her shoulder. I called my girlfriend and asked her immediately what was going on. She said Anna needed a place to go for a few hours while her ex moved out of the apartment. I asked how she got in the house as I locked it. Ashton said she made Anna a key months ago in case she ever needed to get in. I was furious and told her to tell Anna to get out or I'd be calling the police. Ashton called and Anna left. Not before calling me a jerk. So I decided today to change the locks and get a new garage access code. Ashton will have to request access through the garage and I will give access. Ashton is upset, but I told her that this is going to be the way it is until her sister finds a place because I can't trust I won't come home and find two kids and a woman living in my house. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. And in my opinion, you need to think seriously about your relationship with Ashton. The fact that she went behind your back is a major red flag. I wouldn't make any rash decisions, but she's violated his trust in a big way here. Forgiving this once or twice is acceptable, but beyond that, it's game over. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Her and her sister both sound like parasites, bruh. You should really dump her. Am I the jerk for getting back into my car and driving home when my mom told me what her emergency was? I'm 22, male. My dad left my mom four years ago. He said he was waiting for me to be in college to finally be over with her. This might sound bad, but my mother is horrible and she totally deserved it. She treated my dad and pretty much everyone around her like crap for most of my childhood and teenage years. Her sisters cut her off. She doesn't have any friends and my older sister, who's 26, abandoned her. But silly me still have some soft spot for her because she's my mother and she's utterly alone. So I still visit her some weekends, drive her around, get her her groceries and fix things around the house. I try my best to have pretty much every Saturday or Sunday totally free just for her, but sometimes I just can't. I have classes from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and I have a part-time job from 4 to 12, so sometimes I end the day totally demolished. My mom knows that there will be some weekends that I won't be able to go visit her, and while sometimes she understands that, she's totally demanding that I have to be there whenever she needs me because I owe her. She would rather go a week with only takeout and limit products than walking two blocks down her house to a small convenience store to get them herself. This last three weeks have been rough. I have a huge pile of homework and projects that I have to finish before May. My job has been an absolute nightmare and I've been having problems with my roommate, but I would rather live like this than moving back to my mom and becoming her live-in maid that has to do everything for her. Last Friday, I was driving back home around 3.30 it was my day off, so I was planning on sleeping all day. My mom called me and asked me to come home ASAP. I asked what was happening and she said she needed something. 
I said that my week has been pretty bad and that I would rather just go to my place and rest. She promised it was an emergency. So I said, okay, I'm on my way. When I arrived and asked what happened, she said that she needed some milk, bread, toilet paper, and cigarettes. I said, what? You said it was an emergency. And she said, it is an emergency. I also need some stuff for the bathroom. You know what? Let me write it down. So when she got inside the house, I just hopped back into my car and left. She called a few times, but I didn't answer. And when I got to my house, I turned my phone off and went to sleep. I woke up around midnight, turned my phone on, and I had a bunch of missed messages from my mom and some relatives and they called me a jerk because I was already there and that it was rude of me to leave my mother like that. So I don't know. Am I the jerk? Entitled parent demands a free painting and flips out when I refuse. Okay, so for a little context, I am a high school student in my junior year and I've won various awards for my oil paintings. Some of my works are displayed in local galleries as well, and I take commissions, which vary in price depending on the type of painting they want. Most of my patrons request biblical paintings, since I am best at painting in a Renaissance Baroque style, and I love to paint scenes with lots of movement. That being said, I also paint a lot of portraits of families, local politicians, etc. Basically, if you pay me, I will paint anything. This all happened before all the craziness started, and I was displaying some of my work at my school's art fair. Basically, the district rented a huge auditorium where various schools would display their best work and then auction it off for charity. It was a fun event and a surprising amount of people showed up. Now here is where it starts. I had about 5 or 6 paintings on display. Most of them were depictions of Greek myths slash stories with a few exceptions being a painting of Jesus' crucifixion and a painting of my girlfriend as a goddess, which she is. I had some business cards that my dad had gotten for me which had some of my info just in case people wanted to commission me, along with a pamphlet of my prices and such. In comes the entitled parent with her baby and a carrying thingy. I don't know what they're called. They look like baskets. I'm sure you've seen one before. I must say, the baby looked pretty new. Their face was all swollen and they looked pretty small. Why would she bring a newborn baby to a crowded area with lots of noise? I don't know, but hey, I'm not a baby expert. She grabbed a business card and examined it, then looked back at my paintings. Entitled Parent Hey, these are pretty good. Obviously nowhere near as good as the old masters, but a pretty close second, I guess. Though for a 16-year-old, they're pretty good. Me Oh, thanks, I guess. I've been painting for a pretty long time, and I'm glad that people enjoy my stuff. I appreciate the compliment. Oh, I see you do commissions. How much for one of me and my baby? Me Well, it depends what you want. What did you have in mind? Maybe us laying in a field or something. I don't know, something cute. Me. Oh, I can do that. What size did you have in mind? Entitled Parent points to the Jesus painting, which was 16 by 20. So a standard medium-ish painting. Me. Okay, well, for two people, normally it would be about $200. But since your baby is not a grown adult, I can make it 125. What? That's ridiculous. Why are you charging so much for a painting anyways? Me. Well, usually a painting that size takes me about 20 hours at least, and the paint that I use is pretty expensive too. Not counting the canvas or paint mediums that can be pretty pricey too. I don't care about that stuff. Why can't you just do it for free, huh? I am a single mother, and I really want this painting done. At this point, I am floored. She's asking for 20 plus hours of work for free when I have school on top of it? Me. Sorry, I don't think I can do that for you. It's just not worth my time. I have school to balance as well. I am a single mother, and you are telling me to pay $100 for this trash? Do you have no heart? I have to work so hard to provide for my daughter. I can't believe that you could be so heartless. At this point, she's yelling at me pretty loudly. Her baby is surprisingly still sound asleep. The couple I was talking to earlier comes to my defense. The girl. If you work so hard, then you would understand that doing hours of work for no pay is not worth it. The guy. Yeah, if you work 20 hours and then didn't get your paycheck, you'd be pretty angry, huh? Entitled parent. That isn't the same thing. She is a high school student. She doesn't need the money. She can spare a few hours for me. Me. What? No, I can't. I am not giving you a painting for free. End of story. Either pay for it or leave. She gets red in the face at this point. She is seething in anger. You little jerk. I can't believe how rude you are. You don't even care that I work so hard. 
me. You're right, I don't. Now if you aren't going to commission me, then can you please leave? You're making a scene when I have been nothing but nice to you. Fine, I will leave. She then walked up to one of my paintings and took it off the wall. Her baby wakes up and starts to cry, probably from all the noise. She begins to shush her baby and speed walks towards the exit, but not before a man, who I assume is a teacher or something, grabs her arm and attempts to take the painting back. She puts the baby carrier on the floor and attempts to wrestle it out of the guy's hands. They fumble for a while, yelling at each other while struggling with the painting. I should probably note at this point that the painting didn't have a frame or any protective glass over it. I probably should have done that, but it was too late. She ripped the painting out of his hand and smashed it against the floor like a hard rock singer in his guitar. Wood went flying everywhere. People were screaming at her. I was crying because I don't know how to handle my emotions. She turned back to me, sweaty and red. See what happens when you are rude little jerk? Bad things. I hope you've learned your lesson. At this point, I didn't respond. I'm on the floor crying near my painting that I had put so much work into. The wood had pierced the canvas and now there was a huge hole in the middle of the painting. Entitled Parent gets dragged out of the venue as various teachers and other students try to comfort me. Eventually, I calm down a little and the event goes on. I did get about five commissions, so I guess it wasn't all bad, but I'm still furious about what happened. I'm just glad that I never get to see her again. Karen demands I get off my treadmill so she can use it. To put things into perspective, at my university's gym, we have eight treadmills. There are two together at one end of the gym, and the rest are all in their own line. However, in the line of six, the second and fifth treadmill are out of order. I was on a treadmill at the gym today when a woman approached me and said, Hey, I need that treadmill. I was on the third treadmill in the row. When the woman said this, I noticed two other women getting on the fourth and fifth treadmills, and every other treadmill was free, so it wasn't like I was hogging a machine or anything. So I said, Uh, why? There are open treadmills. She replied, Yeah, but you are on the one next to my friends. I replied, And? And she said, I came here to work out with my friends. I'm not going to be on a treadmill that isn't next to my friends. So I'm asking that you please move to a different treadmill so I can be with my friends. I replied, And I'm declining to move. She then said, But like you said, there are other machines open. So like, you can move to another one. I don't see why you're making this an issue. So I said, you're the one making this an issue. I'm in the middle of my workout and have no obligation to move. I was here first and I said no. I'm not moving. She then said to her friends, this isn't worth it. I'm leaving. The other women stopped their workout and got off the treadmill and started to follow their friend. One of them looked back at me and said to the other, wow, what a jerk. I don't think I was being rude or unreasonable. Was I? Not a jerk at all. She didn't ask nicely at all. She demanded. The entitlement is huge. If she tries this again, report her to the folks at the gym. Yeah, seriously. If she had come up and said, Hey, sorry to bother you, but I was wondering if we could swap places because I'd really like to work out with my friends, then maybe OP would have been more inclined to agree. OP still wouldn't have been the jerk to decline, but a little bit of politeness goes a huge way. Not the jerk. Polite or not, it's rude as heck to ask someone to stop their workout so you can work out with your friends. If she actually worked out, ever, she would know that. Once you're at that heart rate, to have to stop and move because some random person wants to walk with her friends, I would be mad and no matter how polite you were to me, I wouldn't move. She's a jerk for even asking. OP, not the jerk. Not the jerk for asking at all. If she politely asked and OP refused, then neither would have been the jerk. There's nothing wrong with making a polite request. I have to disagree. Interrupting someone's workout for that crap is rude, in and of itself. When I work out, I get into a zone, as well as the treadmill is either on a pre-programmed workout or it's tracking my workout. Please don't interrupt me. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the lady? Please let us know. Never interrupt someone during their workout. My gains are much more important than whatever's going on with you. Stop complaining about your neighbors. Okay, sure. I had moved in an apartment with a roommate last summer. When we first came in, the biggest part of the sale was the fact that the apartment was freshly renovated and soundproof. This one is important and you'll see why. So when we got in, my roommate immediately fell in love with it and I was too. 
When we moved in, we were very careful not to bother anyone, as we wanted to quickly have a good relationship with our neighbors. Oh, did you see the new neighbors? They only move during the day. They don't make sound during the night. What nice people, kind of deal. And we can safely say it worked. What we did not know, however, is that we were only three renters when we first came in. Us on the floor, another family upstairs on the opposite side, and another one on the third floor, with the empty apartment between us. Turns out, the soundproof statement was accurate, but only in regards to the inside-to-outside situation. When our upstairs neighbors moved, it was a nightmare. Sound from 5 a.m. to past midnight, five days in a row, dropping stuff, speaking loudly, yelling, or walking in their apartment with shoes on. Out of frustration on the fifth day, I walk upstairs and meet my neighbor at midnight. I ask them to cease their activities for the night. I have work in the morning and I cannot be kept up all night. I understand they were freshly moved in and they might have had a tight schedule, but midnight was too late to be moving stuff. He didn't reply and closed the door on me. I go downstairs and the sound starts over again. I notify my landlord and he tells me he'll handle it and apologizes for the situation, explaining to me my neighbor was just moving and that he probably didn't understand what I was saying because of a language barrier. The neighbors were extremely loud. I know a lot of Karens will use that as an excuse to talk about their neighbors, but when I say loud, I mean it. There was no stop to their loud noises. It seemed like they couldn't be bothered to hold something without dropping it, or jumping up and down on the floor, or purposely banging things against the wall. I recorded the event and even installed microphones in my home jack to my computer activating and recording every time there is strong vibration to the house. Over 98 events on Monday, February 14th. I was livid. I send that to the landlord and explain this cannot continue. First, the apartment was poorly soundproofed, which meant we were hearing every sound at all times. Second, we had notified the neighbors about the situation and they have ignored it. I have notified the landlord to awaken them to our situation. I report the issue several times and even advised my landlord that they were very heavy thuds coming from upstairs, which worried me. He answered with, Stop complaining about your neighbors already. I have other things to do. I have answered, Understood, sir. Please be advised this will be my last communication and action to help you in that regard. You know when I said I heard loud bangs? Turns out our upstairs neighbor was doing bench press lifting in his living room, and the heavy thuds I kept hearing was him dropping his weights on the ground. I had warned my roommate about removing anything she didn't want broken from the living room, and lo and behold, four days later, the first crack appeared. Then another. The floor was giving up. I moved the couch out of the way and moved the TV and consoles into the bedroom. Fast forward to three days ago. After another series of loud bangs, I hear a loud crack, followed by an, oh no, followed by very loud noises. I went to the living room to see my neighbor on the ground with several injuries due to the fact that he just went through the floor and brought his bench and weight rack with him. I called an ambulance and the police. The police asked me if I reported the issue with my landlord, which I could confirm due to my communications being made via email. I sent everything and I am now, of course, filing to break my lease due to uninhabitable dwelling. The landlord came in yesterday and just proceeded to explode told me I should have made him aware that my neighbor was doing dangerous things, to which I answered I had notified him about the very loud sounds and he never investigated, and that he also ordered me to stop complaining about my neighbors. It was not my responsibility to go out of my way to protect his assets if he is unwilling to cooperate with me. My neighbors, roommate, and I are now residing in a hotel until we can find a new place to live. We are now also looking towards adding a bit more salt to the injury I may be filing for criminal negligence against both our landlord and the neighbor. The first because the apartment was apparently having some flaws and the latter for endangering us. Had I not caught up on what caused the sound earlier, me or, God forbid, my roommate could have been under that. Anyway, it was a fun week and I do enjoy the accommodations of the hotel. Never went to a four-star spa included hotel before. Turns out the chocolate on the pillow is a lie and I am very disappointed about that. Edit. As I have advised to a few commentators, I followed up with my roommate and she did not take pictures of the event. She got a bit mad I asked considering what just happened and questioned my priorities. I then explained that our reddit story got a lot of attention and some people in the comments requested some visual proof. I will spare you her answer. 
I will just add that it's okay not to believe this story based on my word alone. If people actually didn't question it, I would be worried. When I posted this story, my only intent was to share my experience and I thought, huh, malicious compliance, neat. If there was a horrible landlord, bad neighbor, Reddit, I would have found prior to submitting this story, probably would have went there instead. I will also add that I'm not an expert or an engineer. How and why something like weights and the like would cause part of the floor to collapse, I cannot say. Was there a structural damage prior? Was there water damage that was never addressed, just covered up? Was the structure just not as sound as I believed it was when I got in? I can't say. I understand some of you might have worked in construction and never have experienced such an event or have actual reasons to suspect a lie due to personal and professional experience. Once again, you can and should question anything on the internet. I just hope you also apply that kind of skepticism, and I mean wanting proof or the opinion of an actual expert prior to making a decision, to more than just Reddit posts. For those who made us laugh and those who have spoken to us, who have been encouraging and constructive, people who actually gave us advice, I thank you very much. It was very nice of everyone, and I wish you the best. Don't worry about the people telling you your story is fake. It's Reddit. They'll always find something to complain about. $15 per minute. I've got another fun shipyard story I thought people might enjoy. So by this point in life, I had moved to another city and become a tugboat captain. I eventually built the show up enough that I had two boats and three guys working for me. It was a difficult business to keep functioning, but I did my best. We primarily did ship assist work and shifted dead ships around in various yards. A dead ship refers to one that isn't currently crewed up and running, so it's unable to move around by itself. Anyway, one of our customers was a great big shipyard that was constantly shuffling things around. They had five dry docks, a dozen whirlies, cranes, several thousand feet of pier. It was a pretty big show. While this yard was in the habit of moving boats around on pretty much daily basis, we'd get told boat A needs to be under crane number six at 07, boat X needs to enter dry dock number four at 930, things like this. The problem was that nobody there coordinated anything with each other. The superintendents barely talked to the shop foreman. The foreman didn't care what each other were doing. So we'd get these marshalling orders that didn't make any sense. If we did exactly as told, things would take all day. So I'd say, hey, if we do these in the other order, or hold this one, move up by 10 minutes, then everything will work out a lot more smoothly, and we can get out of here and quit billing you. Because keep in mind, this wasn't our only customer. We had other yards calling all day who needed their own work done. So to keep everyone happy, we had to try and be as efficient as possible. Well, this was all fine and things operated along these lines for many years with me being the de facto coordinator. One day though, they hired this new yard superintendent, the boss of the whole yard, who in the space of three weeks royally messes everything up. This guy calls me on the carpet as much as you can with a subcontractor and tells me to keep my nose out of it and do like I'm told. I say, you got it boss. And honestly, that was probably the greatest day of my life. I went back out to the boat, climbed up in my wheelhouse and spent eight hours doing two hours worth of work. I figured that this was going to get real expensive real fast. And once I had turned in an invoice or two, someone was going to raise heck. Here's the thing though, no one ever did, ever. We'd get told to do X job first, then do job B. Well, that's fine and all, but if done in that order, we'd have to sit there and wait for five hours because X being in the way precluded B getting done. Five hours at $900 an hour for our two boats. It was ridiculous. It got to the point rather quickly where we'd get all set for the next part of the job and then just shut the engines down and relax. This went on for 15 years until, surprise, surprise, that yard went out of business. I should mention too, that isn't how I normally roll. I can't stand dragging my feet on purpose. In this case though, I had to stop and say, no one appreciated my help when I was helping and they don't even notice that I've stopped. So why am I trying to cut my own income if this customer doesn't even seem to care? Am I the jerk for laughing at the absurdity of my wife taking pictures of herself cleaning? I, 36 male, work full time and my wife, who's 27, stays at home. We've been married for five years. I have a good job, so I'm happy to support her. We do not have kids. My wife is something of a slob. I know this isn't the nicest thing to say about your partner, but she would happily step over a pile of clothes in our living room for a month before actually folding them. During the daytime, she doesn't really cook, clean, or do any housework at all. 
She loves browsing the internet and watching Netflix, but beyond her interests, she can rarely gather up the energy to do much at all. To be honest, before marriage, when I lived alone, my house was much cleaner than it is now. The bizarre thing about this situation is that she's incredibly sensitive about the fact that she doesn't really do much all day and denies it whenever it's brought up. I do my own laundry, prepare my own lunches, and oftentimes cook dinner. She might do the dishes in the evening or she'll leave them for the next day. A few days ago, I got really tired of it because a pile of her stuff that I didn't know where to put away had been sitting in our living room for over a week. I told her that she really needs to get it together and learn how to clean, even a little, every day. She fired back that she's not a maid, to which I responded, it was clear, because if she went to someone's house, laid on their sofa, and watched Netflix for six hours, she would have been fired on her first day. The next day after I get home from work, my wife and I were still kind of going at it. She suddenly approached me and showed me pictures she took of herself cleaning during the day, repeating, see, this is what I do during the day. I couldn't help myself and began laughing at how ridiculous it was, then said having a fake photo shoot like an Instagrammer didn't mean she was doing a good job around the house. She says I crossed the line. Now she's sulking in her room. I feel like she's trying to emotionally manipulate me, but I could have pushed it too far. Not the jerk, but this sounds like me before I was on ADHD meds and antidepressants. That's exactly what I was thinking. When your brain doesn't brain the same way as other people, you can actually come across as lazy and messy when you're really just struggling. Yeah, the problem here is how does OP approach this topic with his wife without her taking it as him saying, there must be something medically wrong with you to act this way, which I don't think would go over particularly well. If it's pure laziness, obviously that's on her. And while a cleaning photo shoot is maybe silly, I think this is missing the big picture. Everything else sounds potentially like serious mental health issues, such as depression or ADHD, a sleep disorder, or other physical illness that can cause chronic fatigue. It may not actually be good for her mental health to be home all the time. I hated going back into work, but it was amazing for me to get out of the house. I really think she needs to speak with a professional about the possibility of depression. She may need help, not mockery. ETA, some condensed great points people are making in the replies. Women in their 20s can develop autoimmune disease, usually accompanied by fatigue that ramps up over the years. Even if she did not already have depression, ADHD, or similar, being isolated at home without structure or purpose is a recipe for disaster. It will lead to depression-like symptoms, even if it doesn't become a full true diagnosis. All that said, I don't personally think there's a jerk here. I think she needs a doctor's visit and to get a job, even part-time to get out of the house and get structure and purpose in her days. As with most posts here, honest adult communication will go a long way. So you married a 22-year-old when you were 31 and probably started dating her when she was 19 or 20 and you were 29 or 30? And you're surprised that this is how she acts? Everyone sucks here. Believe it or not, lots of 22-year-olds everywhere keep a clean home and don't leave laundry in piles for weeks. And believe it or not, a lot of 22-year-olds have never lived alone before and are probably used to just having a bedroom in their parents' house. A lot of 22-year-olds probably have parents that take care of the housework if they live at home. They got married when she was 22. They most likely started dating a few years before that. Laughing at some of the comments. I, as you can tell from my name, am most likely older than most here. I have stayed at home for most of my 30 plus years of marriage. If a grown adult cannot even do the basics without sitting down to discuss what is expected of them, something is wrong. OP, maybe you do need to sit down, discuss what needs to be done, and even make a chart of who does what when. Maybe your wife never had to clean for herself or figure out what needed to be done when. Calmly together, make a list. Figure out how often and who does what. If you have a yard, include those chores. I'm not saying your wife doesn't deserve downtime or even lazy days. I don't think you are the jerk for laughing about the picture. I would have expected that when my kids were teenagers. Not the jerk. Yes, I'm looking at all these people saying he's wrong and thinking they might be teenagers because adults and functional relationships both have to contribute. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or his wife? Please let us know. If that is out of character for her, there could be something wrong. I hope she's okay. If that's just how she's always been, then you're in trouble, buddy boy. Am I the jerk for not compromising on where we go to lunch because of my food allergy? A while ago, I was awarded for my work. It's not valuable, just a frame certificate, but it was voted on by my peers. That weekend, I turned 40. 
On the Monday, my manager, Janine, and her boss, Kara, said they wanted us to celebrate these events as a team and asked where I would like to go for lunch. I was conflicted because there's been a history of disputes around my food allergy. In short, they always go to a nearby Chinese restaurant, but I am allergic to soy, which features in Chinese food. Kara has informed HR to find a solution, but so far they've been useful as a chocolate teapot. In meetings though, they have insisted they want to include me, and this was the first time they had asked for my suggestions. So in the end, I suggested a new Indian restaurant my partner and I had been to. I told Janine I knew Indian wasn't everyone's favorite, so if there were any problems, I'd suggest something else. Janine said, there's nothing wrong with that. Ooh, yum, yum, yum. Two days later, Kara emailed that we were having lunch to celebrate my award and the big 4-0 at the Indian restaurant. Unfortunately, I was talking to Janine at the time Kara's email arrived. Janine did have some issues with Indian food, which she alerted me to by screaming them in my face and having a meltdown. I calmed Janine down, then went back to my desk and broke down myself. Carolyn, manager of the next team, came over and consoled me. I was shaking so badly. Carolyn filled in the incident report for me, then emailed Janine and Kara to say I was leaving work and drove me to my GP. GP gave me a week off work. Now I am back at work and it's bad. Kara postponed lunch until I was better and expected it to still go ahead as planned. Janine wants it moved to the Chinese restaurant they always go to and HR is backing Janine because she is not coping with change and I should accommodate her. I shot back with accommodating Janine could hurt me in the process. I just want the whole thing to drop because I'm fed up. Kara wants to be the peacemaker and has suggested I meet them halfway. I don't know where halfway is and I can't be bothered finding it. Kara, Janine, and HR all say I am the jerk for not being prepared to compromise on where we go out to lunch. I need fresh perspectives on this. Am I the jerk? By the way, the two restaurants are literally across the road from each other. Not the jerk. Reply to the necessary parties with, I thank you for wishing to celebrate my achievement. However, it has been brought to my attention that my potentially deadly allergy has created an unacceptable situation regarding the selection of meal locale for said celebration. As I do not want to cause any further issues, I politely ask that we not celebrate the achievement. I will be content with the certificate I have been gifted and any congratulatory statements I receive. As I do not want the controversy to continue, please do not continue to press the issue or attempt to pressure me into changing my choice on this action. Make it clear that, as this is supposed to celebrate you, you have made the choice to not have any further celebration or acknowledgement and simply wish life to go on with minimal fuss. Also, keep copies of any documents, emails, notes, meeting minutes, etc., of all the interactions regarding this situation, and even record, if you can, and it's legal, interactions. Being screamed at is not cool, and having a record of that interaction would help protect you in the event of a complaint against you. OP. Trust me, I have kept everything. Plus, Carolyn, the manager from the next team, has included herself as a witness. My friend from her team came over and told me he'd put in a report too, as a witness. I think I'm pretty well covered. I have suggested that as the issue has been distressing for myself and others, that we not progress the matter of the lunch any further. Kara and HR are both digging their heels in and saying it must go ahead. I'm going to sleep on it tonight and see whether tomorrow brings new ideas. The words complex intersecting disabilities spring to mind. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their coworkers? Please let us know. Here's the three magic words I'd tell them. Thanks, but no thanks. Isn't that four words? Are you daft? Am I the jerk for holding a grudge and refusing to reconnect with the high school mean girl? Throw away account and I'm British, so apologies if I use terminology you aren't familiar with. Just a heads up, this situation is stupid. I've known this girl, I'll call her Jay, my whole life, and I was never close friends with her. But we were forced to be in constant close proximity to one another because of how close our families were. Jay hated me. She mocked my appearance, how weird I was, said it was a miracle I had friends, etc. I would speak to my parents about it and they'd tell me to ignore it because she's like family. One time we were in an English class and she was on my table with four other guys and she, out of nowhere might I add, said, OP told me she wants to be a dancer when she grows up. And the whole table of guys busted out laughing while I sat there denying it with my face bright red. I know it sounds small and dumb as it is, but at the time I was so embarrassed and wanted the ground to swallow me whole. 
and she just thought it was hilarious. Nothing wrong with being a dancer, of course, but I was an insecure teenager, and it was just a weird thing for her to say. When boys would play that cruel prank by asking me out as a joke and then giggling about it with their friends, if you know, you know, she would just giggle along. I could go on. Imagine my shock when, weeks ago, a friend texted me a link to a TikTok and said, OMG, isn't this Jay? Indeed it was. It was one of those trends where you stitch another TikTok with your own experience, and it was Jay talking about how boys would ask her out as a joke at school, and it made her realize that they were horrible to those who they found unattractive. And, uh, does she not remember the way she would giggle while she watched boys do the exact same thing to me? Anyways, I haven't seen her in person since we left school. We went to different universities, and she moved to another city. Yesterday, my mom called me to let me know that Jay was moving back to our city and wants to reconnect with me, and my first thought was, oh no. I told my mom I'd pass on that, and my mom sounded disappointed in me for holding grudges over things that happened when you two were just kids. She called me immature and said that maybe Jay wanted to make things right. I doubled down and said I wasn't interested. Well, I didn't know this at the time, but my mom had our phone conversation on speaker and Jay was right there with her. It was supposed to be a surprise for when I got home and saw her there. My mom told me later that she was very shocked and hurt that I shouldn't have said what I said. I do feel bad and also just plain embarrassed because I didn't know she heard what I said. I had literally cackled out loud when my mom brought up Jay and I reconnecting. I'm not sure how to feel now. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You're entitled to decide who your friends are and don't feel embarrassed that she was on speaker. Truth hurts and hopefully she'll get the hint. I don't think Jay can be embarrassed. Like OP said, Jay made a TikTok describing what she did to her, but Jay just put herself in OP's situation. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Jay? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for blaming the fact our house got robbed on my girlfriend? My girlfriend and I are both 23 and live in a pretty small town where everybody knows everybody. Last week, I went on a trip to see my parents, leaving my girlfriend at home by herself with our dog. The way she tells it, she took our dog out to do her business in the morning, and when she did, a man we had never seen put his head over the wall where we share with our neighbors and asked if my girlfriend was going out that day because he was doing roofing work on the house next door and didn't want the noise to bother her. An obvious red flag to me, but not to my girlfriend, who decided to tell him her plans for the day, which included going out. She went out with the dog and came back to the house having been robbed. There wasn't loads taken, but my laptop was among the things that were. She called me, obviously upset, and when I asked her who it could have been, she told me about the morning incident. Turned out she hadn't even locked the back door, after just telling this random man she was going to be out of the house all day. I told her that it was completely her fault and that her lack of critical thinking is concerning and told her, as a joke, to go to a doctor. We've been arguing about it ever since and everyone has pretty much told me that I'm being harsh on her and it isn't her fault. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. She already knows she messed up. No need to kick her while she's down. And frankly, it could have been much worse. She was alone. Anything could have happened. She needs to learn to be more aware and cautious. You need to learn to express your anger and the like in a healthier way. Everyone sucks here. Are you right about her being an idiot? Yes. Did you need to treat her like that to make your point? No. You're the jerk. Your girlfriend should have locked the door, yes. But things do slip and that doesn't mean that you should blame the robbery on her. The robbery was the fault of the robber. This will be a learning lesson for her, and the punishment is that she had to go through this alone. You weren't there, and the moment that she told you about it, you judged her and got mad at her instead of consoling her. If you don't see how harsh and rude that was, then you definitely deserve that rating. The better response would have been to ask if she was okay, ask her how it happened, and then talk through how that could be prevented in the future and learn from it. Not scold her for something she had no way of knowing what happened. Rude. All these people saying OP is a jerk or too harsh is complete and utter BS. It doesn't matter if she lives in a small town where people know each other. She literally told a guy that she's never seen before her entire day's plans and didn't even lock the house down before leaving. She is a major idiot like so many people in here defending this major mess up. At least they could say everyone sucks here, but no. Oh, your poor girlfriend is already upset and you should control your anger better. So one time emotions are valid and the other times they are not? The joke was placed weird, but I get it that OP is mad. What if there had been something of greater value in there? Maybe a pet. 
soft, everyone sucks here. You shouldn't have said that comment, but bro, girlfriend is kind of lacking in common sense. If everyone in town knows everybody, I'm going to be wary about the random guy I don't know asking me about if I'll be home or not, and I definitely wouldn't give him an estimate of how long I'll be gone or what I'll be doing. You don't just tell that to anyone. And then not locking the back door? I really would have been angry too. You always lock the door. I have anxiety and check my purse for my keys like three times before I leave and once after I'm out the door. It was definitely her fault for giving him the tools he needed to rob the place, but that one joke wasn't necessary. If you're angry, just be angry. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. This is why you shouldn't date people with single digit IQs. Karen gets busted for plagiarizing a piece of artwork in class. I've been doing art in multiple forms since I was really young. I've never been interested in art as a career or a job. It's something I started doing to express myself and to help my anxiety. I've been posting my drawings on Instagram just for fun. And through this, I became friends with a somewhat popular artist. We will call her Dana. By popular, I don't mean millions of followers. I mean she has a little over 25,000 followers. Not an extreme amount, but still a good following. We became rather close through Instagram. Now, Dana is an amazing artist. This girl can make a drawing look like a photo. Now back to the main point. It all happened in art class. We previously had an assignment to do an art piece that shows how the world has changed due to what's going on. When first given the assignment, our art teacher, we will call her Mrs. G, told us that she would pick five pieces of work to enter into an art contest being held by the local art center. Anyone interested in being picked should tell her after class. The prize was a $100 gift card to the local Michaels store, which is the best art store around here. Now, I'm perfectly content with my cheap dollar store art supplies. As I said, I don't take my art too seriously, it's just for fun, so I didn't enter. Now comes Wednesday. Mr. G had picked the drawings and they were posted outside of the art room. Now when I looked at one of the winner's drawings, it completely stuck out to me. It was an art piece submitted by a girl who we will call Candy. I knew I had seen that exact piece before. On Dana's page. She had done it about a month back. I even pulled up the post on Dana's page and held them side by side, completely copied. Now here's where I might be the jerk. I ratted her out to Mrs. G going as far as showing her Dana's Instagram page, namely the piece Candy copied. Now Mrs. G has a rule, no tracing and or copying art, original pieces only unless the assignment mentioned otherwise. So Mrs. G was not happy. She confronted Candy, who tried denying it at first, but admits she copied it once presented with proof. She also went back and looked at Candy's previous works and saw that she copied most of those as well. Candy was sent to the office and didn't come back for the rest of the day. From what I heard, her punishment was having her piece taken down and being disqualified from the competition, obviously. She was given a failing grade on the assignment and she was given three days out of school suspension. Now, her and her friend are harassing me for turning her in, calling me a rat, saying I shouldn't have butted my nose where it doesn't belong, saying it's not my business. But isn't it my business? Dana is my friend, and Candy was going to enter Dana's hard work into a competition claiming it was hers. If she had won, the piece would hang in the art center with her name on it. That just doesn't sit well with me. Am I the jerk for ratting on a girl for plagiarizing a piece of artwork in class? My wife won't stop bragging about making more money than me. My wife has her master's degree and works at a top Forbes 5 company. I have a GED, professional licenses, and some college. When we got married, she made more money than me, and that's still the same case now. I'm okay with it, not insecure at all, but my wife won't stop bringing up her money to me every day. She says things like, I make the money, I pay all the bills, your job ain't nothing, etc. I'm not exaggerating, I hear about money every day. In the recent past, when I was on the road making more money, she complained I'm not helping raise the kids. When I'm working locally, she says the money isn't good enough. I have applied for over 1,200 jobs on Indeed in the last two years. I follow up, show up, and everything hoping to get a higher paying job because my wife keeps rubbing her income in my face. I had zero dollars in my account till payday this week, and she had thousands but got mad I used her money to buy a fish sandwich for lunch. She said do not ask me for gas money even though she knows I'm at zero dollars, so I scrapped up my change. At home, she constantly buys new stuff for her biological kids, but not my daughter who is in my custody. 
My wife says, that's not my biological daughter. Tell her mom to buy her stuff. When it comes to my money, I buy all the kids stuff and pay as much bills as I can, but it still isn't good enough. This is my first and only marriage and I want to honor my oath to God and my wife, but this is so hard. She literally looks at me like nothing and I'm trying my hardest to make more money. We are not struggling. She makes way more than what the bills are, but hates that I can't afford to pay half sometimes or all of them for her. What do I do? I'm tired of her bashing me to her parents, brothers, friends, and even my own family. I have made well over $150,000 in our four years of marriage, but she says I never have contributed a dime to our relationship literally. It's so frustrating to work this hard and still be looked down on. Am I the jerk for screaming at her to quit badgering me about making more money than me every day? I didn't want to scream, but her face, looking like I disgust her, really touched me. Thanks for reading. Not the jerk. Start keeping logs and call an attorney. She'll always look down on you and belittle you. Is that what you want your daughter to see and emulate? Get out now. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you stay with someone who treated you like this or not? Please let us know. If you ever talked to me like that, Reddit boy, I'd be gone in the blink of an eye. I told my dad that if his girlfriend's kid comes camping, I'm not going. So I'm 17, male. I graduate high school in May. Since I was a freshman, my dad and I have planned on going out west camping for two and a half weeks in summer after graduation. Go to Colorado, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Last summer, we were discussing it, and my brother, Jed, who's 15 now, seemed interested. I guess he asked my dad if he could come, and my dad later asked me if that was cool, because otherwise he'd take Jed on a weekend local trip or something. I said it was fine, since I want to spend some time with Jed too before I go to college. So we've been planning a way and picking campgrounds to stay, trails to hike, sights to see. We're all excited. Last July slash August, my dad started dating Bonnie. She's nice and everything. She also has a 10-year-old son, Toby. Toby's alright for a kid. He behaves and everything, but I don't really do much with him because we're obviously not into the same things and it feels like unpaid babysitting more than anything. Yesterday, Jed and I were by our dad's and he said, how would you guys feel if Toby came along on our camping trip? We could maybe hit some amusement parks so he'd have fun too. Jed looked at me and I said, um, I wouldn't want him to. I mean, it's supposed to be just us. He doesn't even like that stuff. Dad said, well, Bonnie and I were talking and we're starting to get more serious and think that it's important for you to all bond more. I said, I don't want some random little kid coming with us on a trip that we've been planning for years. My dad said, He's 10, he's not a little kid, and he might be your stepbrother one day, so you should get to know him more. I said, fine, but if he's going camping, then I'm not. I left and went back to my mom's, because my dad will keep bringing something up and discussing it until you just agree, and I didn't feel like dealing with it. When my dad brought Jed home, apparently he talked to our mom. My mom talked to me and said that Jed doesn't want to go either if I'm not going. My dad already put in for vacation time and made reservations, so maybe I should just go and it will be fun. I shouldn't back out of something I've been looking forward to just because of Toby. Am I the jerk for saying I won't go if Toby goes and planning to follow through? Not the jerk. You don't force bonding on anyone. This was supposed to be your special time with your brother and dad camping, and now he's expecting you to change the plans by going to amusement parks to accommodate Toby? It would be one thing if Toby likes camping as much as you guys and you were legitimately close to him, but this is forced. I hope you get to have a special camping trip regardless, OP. OP. Toby doesn't even like the outdoors. We had a fire and made s'mores one time and Toby kept complaining and asking his mom to go in and play a switch. Not the jerk. If your dad would like to plan something separate and include Toby, great. However, if he'd like to guarantee a permanent rift between all of you, he can stick to this plan to alter the bonding and celebration with you and your brother. It's great to include people when possible, such as you agreed with Jed. It's not great to guilt people, change plans to suit yourself and his girlfriend, and then wonder why everyone isn't interested. I'm sorry that your dad is unable or unwilling to see that this isn't the time or place to attempt bonding. Congratulations on your upcoming graduation, and hopefully you can plan something with Jed alone if your dad doesn't get it together and realize the opportunity he's missing. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their dad? Please let us know. Dad needs to get his spine. 
My dad is forcing me to quit my job. For reference, I'm 17 and I'm in school full time, five days a week. I work 12 to 8 on the weekends and haven't had a day off other than for lockdown leave since August. Of course, my seven day week schedule isn't ideal, but I really appreciate the income and have grown to like my job. Last summer, I really struggled to find myself a job. I was 16 and after dropping in and emailing 40 different employers and revising my CV about a million times, I lost all hope. My parents decided that I was old enough to support myself and cut me off financially and stopped giving me bus money or lifts. I live in the countryside, about 20 kilometers away from all my friends, so I spent the summer completely alone, which was really difficult for me. All of my employed friends had gotten their jobs through their parents or friends of their parents, but my parents still made no effort to put in a personal word on my behalf to any employers they were on friendly terms with. Anyways, August rolled around and I finally got a job at a McDonald's about a half hour drive from me after four months in isolation. My parents immediately turned their noses up at the mention of McDonald's, but I wasn't in any position to be picky and I'm still very grateful for the job. They've always put massive pressure on me to do well in school and so to please them, I've been overexerting myself for months and have a long streak of A's and B's. Unfortunately, I miss a day or two of school on average a month because of my period. For years, I've spent once a month paralyzed with cramps and nausea, which are a million times worse than what any other girl I've talked to about this has ever experienced. I'm convinced I have endometriosis, and I have brought this subject up with my parents again and again over the years and have begged them for a hospital appointment. Four years later, and I still haven't seen anybody about my pains, and I still continue to miss school over it. Despite this, my parents are constantly on my back about the days that I've missed at school and yet neglect to get me any sort of help or treatment for what I'm going through. About two months ago, I missed a week of school because I was sure I had caught it, when in actuality, I had just had a bad case of tonsillitis. My parents were furious when I tested negative and nagged and argued with me about it for about another month until I actually did test positive and ended up missing another full week of school. I have since caught up on all the work I missed and I haven't broken my streak of A's and B's. Today and yesterday I stayed home from school because I've had another bout of tonsillitis, which went untreated last time and this time as well. Apparently this was the breaking point for my dad and he called me down from my room and told me if I didn't either quit my job or drop down to one day a week, he was going to go into my manager's office and withdraw his parental consent himself. He blamed my illness on work and told me that it was unacceptable that I was missing school and told me that I needed to take a day off to dedicate wholly to study. I tried to reason with him and showed him my report cards and recent test results and told him my grades were perfect and that I couldn't be blamed for getting sick. He shut me down and told me that my grades didn't matter because the fact remained that I was still missing school. I'm unsure what to do or how to change my dad's mind. I know a seven day week is extreme for someone my age, but I have no other option. In order to see my friends and do nice things in the city outside of school, I need funds. In order to have funds, I need a job. My parents want me to have both a school life and a social life, but won't give me a single cent out of their pocket to get me out of my countryside jail cell. Pocket money is out of the question. I've tried to negotiate my way into making some kind of deal with them by doing good in school and doing any chores my parents ask of me but their argument is that I shouldn't be rewarded for doing the bare minimum of what is expected from me. Now that I have my own job, I'm financially independent and can no longer be guilt tripped by them about money or by my laziness. I'm currently saving for a month long holiday during the summer and I already have deposits laid down and plane tickets bought. Still, I need to earn a little extra money to pay for the entire thing. It's my reward to myself for the effort I've put in at school and for all the hours I've worked. I really want to do something nice for myself before I hunker down and inevitably quit my job for my final year at school next year. For me, my job allows me to actually do nice things for myself and to see my friends. Quitting it or slicing my income in half is not an option. Without it, my parents have made it very clear that they would not support me or give me any kind of pocket money to get a bus to see my friends or to treat myself. I've proved to my parents time and time again that I can excel in school take care of my physical and mental health, see my friends, and simultaneously work, but they're still not satisfied. I'm very frustrated by this whole situation as I am an only child who is fortunate enough to have two working parents who are married happily. 
Still, it often bothers me that I have friends with five siblings and a single mother who have better financial support than me. Of course, I know people's financial situations are not nearly as straightforward as that and I don't mean to sound spoiled, but it is frustrating for me and I wish my life could be different. What can I do? Am I being a jerk by not obeying them? Is this fair? Any advice would be appreciated so much. Side note, just to clarify, yes, my parents buy me food and let me live under their roof and pay for my schooling, just in case that wasn't clear. But it doesn't go much farther than them paying for my basic needs. Clothes, sanitary products, etc. are all bought by me. If I were you, I'd be saving up to get out of there. Your parents sound exhausting. I wouldn't even worry about if they were proud of me. Forget them. I'd get good grades for myself. I'd worry about making myself proud. My dad started the whole pay for your toiletries and stuff yourself when I was 12. He cut me off completely at 14. My stepmom didn't want me anymore. I bounced around between relatives for high school. I was a straight A student and had never been in trouble. I graduated and joined the military. I stopped worrying about what he thought a long time ago and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Now he asks if I'm going to take care of him when he's old. I laughed in his face. Am I the jerk for eating at the same restaurant as my husband's family? I, 32 female, have been married to my husband, 35 male, for three years. We dated for two years before that. I want to start this off by saying that he really is a good guy in other areas. My husband's parents, his two brothers, ages 38 and 40, and his brother's girlfriends and fiancés have a tradition of going out to dinner once a month. I am invited about 50% of the time. I've talked to my husband's brother's fiancé and she says she is invited every time. When I say I'm not invited, I mean that my husband tells me, I'm going to the family dinner. It's probably best if you sit this one out. When I expressed that I wanted to come, he told me that it would be for the best if I didn't. It has caused several fights. About a week ago, my husband went to a family dinner that I wasn't invited to. I was very upset. So earlier that day, I called and made a reservation at the restaurant they were going to. My husband left the house, not knowing about my reservations, and I left 15 minutes after him. I ended up seated at a table where I couldn't see his family, so I got up as if I was going to the bathroom and walked right past them. They were all there, including his brother's significant others. So husband looked completely shocked and asked me what I was doing there. I told him that I had just been dying for a steak, so I came and got one at the restaurant. My mother-in-law said it was very rude of me to interrupt their family dinner. I pointed out that I wasn't trying to join them, I was just going to the bathroom. I told them to have a good meal and I left. I went and finished my steak by myself. My husband was really upset when he came home and he told me that he couldn't believe how much of a jerk I had been. I said that he was a jerk for not inviting me to his dinners when his brother's significant others got to go. My husband said that the decision to invite was between him and his family and I should respect that. Anyway, with the way the word jerk was thrown around, it made me think of this sub, so I wanted to ask if I am the jerk. Am I? Not the jerk. Honestly, I would divorce, straight to divorce. Your husband's behavior is past the point of no return. Why put up with this? Such disrespect. Ask husband why he excludes you, because this comes from him. I would probably divorce him, but at the very least, never attend another one of his family's events. Always plan something fun for yourself. This is so belittling. Please update and best of luck. I feel you would be much happier without him. Am I the jerk for charging parents who brought their kids to our child-free wedding and kicking the rowdy kids out? This happened a few months ago, but it was recently brought up again. My husband and I made it clear to guests that our wedding was child-free. I mean, I have a cousin with eight kids and a lot of our family and friends have two to three kids. The kids are generally good, so the main issue was cost. Our venue charges age two and up the same as adults, which is $250 per person, including tax and tip. It would double the cost and our venue wasn't big enough for all of the kids. We wrote this on the website and clarified with anyone who asked and everyone asked. We got a lot of grief over this, so we felt a fair compromise was to 1. Extend the dinner the night before to include kids and the restaurant was very nice about having close to 100 kids. Two. Hire five babysitters for 25 to 30 kids on the wedding night for locals who couldn't find a babysitter last minute and for guests who traveled with their kids. My in-laws offered their home less than 30 minutes away to host all of the kids. On the wedding day, three couples showed up with their kids 
a total of nine kids, two plus three plus four. My husband was more upset than I was because these folks were on his side. Groomsmen offered to drive the kids to the house, but they refused and made a scene. My husband was called to handle it and he said fine, as long as A, they don't cause trouble, and B, the parents pay the price for them, they can stay. The staff even quickly threw together a kids table. I saw that unfolding and avoided it and went about the day since it was a beautiful day and so much was happening. When the ceremony started, one kid started wailing and another skipped down the aisle in front of me. I played it cool and the staff was on top of it. They escorted the mom and the two kids outside. The rest of the ceremony went smoothly. During the reception, the same two kids were screaming and throwing food. Other guests and staff were trying to get them to sit. At one point, one of them ran under me and I almost tripped. My bridesmaids pointed out that the food they threw got on my dress and that's when I had enough. I gave my husband the look and he rounded them up, brought them to their parents and asked them to leave for good. After the event, and this is where we might be the jerks, we sent a bill to the three couples with a letter saying we had a lovely time with them and reminding they agreed to pay for their kids. Two couples paid and were apologetic and even said now they understood why we couldn't include their kids. Of course, the couple with the two rowdy kids refused to pay because we asked them to leave before cake. Seriously. Instead of apologizing, we got a nasty call. All I said was they should be lucky I didn't send the dry cleaning bill for the dress. My husband even said this concludes their friendship. This weekend, they wanted a visit and we said no thanks. They asked if we were still mad about them not paying and uh, yeah, we are. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Stand your ground. You went above and beyond to accommodate guests with kids and they imposed. Not the jerk. At minimum, stand your ground on ending the friendship. They didn't respect you or your husband on a day where they were supposed to be celebrating your love. But I would resend the bill and add the dry cleaning fee as well. You will never get it and it's not like the friendship is salvageable anyhow. Not the jerk. It was pretty clear what the restrictions were and they proved the point on why you had those restrictions in place. Your husband is also right. If friends willfully do something like that and refuse to square up after the fact, that sounds like they were not very good friends at all. It's on them to smooth it over. Threaten to cancel your account? No problem, buddy. It's already done. A couple years ago, I used to work at a call center for a popular company by the name of Netflix. I'm only name dropping because nobody works at that center anymore due to the fact they laid everyone off who didn't want to move to another state. You would not believe the amount of stupidity I would have to deal with, unless you've worked at a call center that is, on a day to day basis. Questions could range from, so when do you guys install the Netflix? To, can't you just make an account for me? With my personal favorite being, what's this email you're talking about? I only have Gmail. And the worst being, how could you take money out of my account? Now I can't feed my kids. Anyways, Dealing with these customers and having the entire site closed down eventually takes its toll and near the end I had little empathy for customers who were rude to me. There was one thing I loved about working there however. We never had to try to keep customers or upsell them anything and as long as we did the job correctly our team leads would almost always back us up if a call was escalated. Then Netflix had its price hike and wasn't able to stream on older devices anymore due to technical issues. You could not imagine the amount of people calling to threaten to cancel because they believed we had the power to individually accompany their needs and wants. Cue malicious compliance. I had this particularly nasty lady whose account was on hold due to lack of payment. She initially called because she was outraged she would have to pay two extra dollars in three months when the price hike took effect. Once I informed her that she couldn't stream anyways due to a lack of payment, she yells, what if I just go ahead and cancel my account then, huh? And like everybody else who threatens this, they severely overestimate my ability to care. She had already stated that she wanted to cancel the account and that was all permission I needed to close it. So after her threat, I tell her, there's no need ma'am, I've already taken care of it for you. In my cheery call center voice that I only reserve for kids and irate customers. She explodes at me and demands my supervisor. Now, like most call centers, all our calls are recorded and our supervisors can go back and listen to any call. Since she had stated she had wanted to cancel, albeit a little sarcastically, I was in the clear. Turns out she really didn't want to cancel, but since her account was officially closed, she would not only need to pay the original amount to restart it, 
but the new price hike as well since the system recognized it as a new account, whereas old accounts were slowly being price changed. Would I be the jerk if I tell my coworker I'm not one of her soldiers? So, I have a coworker that I believe dislikes me. Let's call her B, 43 female. B is ex army, and I, 25 female, am ex navy, but B doesn't know this. She thinks she is the only former service member at our small company and talks about it constantly how the military changed her and how no one else could possibly understand. B and I got hired on the exact same day about six months ago and have similar positions. Mine is a bit more dynamic and hers is a bit more focused. The entire company is working from home, so we have weekly team meetings and company meetings. In these meetings, B has made a habit of privately messaging me on Zoom and basically telling me what to do or what I should be doing. At first, I brushed it off and just kind of responded with, I'll take that into consideration. Well, now it's become a habit. Every meeting, I receive multiple PMs from her about how I should be better at doing my job, despite my bosses and other coworkers being pleased with my work. Her comments come off as really bossy and I'm done with it. I don't want to complain to my manager because it seems like a stupid little thing, but I do want it to stop. Recently, B has been getting more and more passive aggressive with me, rolling her eyes when I talk, smirking when someone asks me a question, not giving me credit when I help her work on a project and so on. I'm really getting the sense she hates me and I don't understand why. I attempted to get to know her better and asked her about her interests and tried to talk about that, but it didn't seem to do much. Recently, I invited her to a virtual happy hour for us to get to know each other better and she never responded, but responded to multiple team channels that I'm in as well. I'm really getting fed up. I've got a meeting tomorrow and I expect a number of bossy comments PM to me throughout the meeting. I'm ready to just reply with, hey B, I'm not sure what your problem is with me, but you're not in the army anymore and I'm not one of your soldiers. Would I be the jerk? I'm really not trying to cause drama, but I'm tired of this. Aside from her, the entire rest of the team is awesome. I'm also getting the vibe that because I'm young, she thinks this is okay in some way. Am I overreacting? Instead of being petty and antagonistic, just go to your manager. Show them screenshots of the messages she's sending you. Not the jerk but handle this like a professional adult and don't squabble with her. Exactly. Her intent is to either have you roll over to her perceived authority or push you into a confrontation where she can paint you as overly emotional and immature. Don't let her create some schoolyard dynamic. Be the bigger person and inform the appropriate people of her behavior. Not the jerk, but handle it the right way. If you confront her directly, it will be what she wants. It will escalate anyway, but happen on her terms. Yeah. OP isn't overreacting, but is wrong to think this is petty to go to a manager with. This is exactly how to handle the situation. That manager can either take it up with B, or if B has a manager, handle it laterally that way. It's much, much better than to be snarky with a person. They need to be redirected by someone in authority and understand they aren't in the position they think they are. Stuff like this comes up on advice blogs like Ask a Manager all the time. Tale as old as time. An experienced manager should know how to handle it. A very embarrassed lady. So, some years ago, I was doing a summer job, working for my mom as her secretary. She's a doctor. I never looked like my mom, and nobody knew I was her daughter. Patients just thought I was some intern or student. During all summer, this mean old lady came to the office almost every two weeks. Not to see the doctors each time, but to sort of hang out in the secretary's office and chat, or ask for test results or whatever but mainly to spend time and complain about everything. The usual secretary often indulges her because she's a regular, but she was on her holiday and I was the only one she could talk to. And talk she did. She was mean against everything. She was a hypocrite and above all, like I said, just plain mean. I always put up a facade with her, polite and smiling, and she seemed to love to teach life to a youngster like me. One day, she decided to talk very badly about her doctor, my mom. She thought I was new and didn't know my boss very well and was bolder than usual. She said all sorts of horrible things about her, trying to spread rumors about her carelessness or bad practice. Then, she asked me a medical question about her test results. Sweetly, I asked her if she wants me to call the doctor to ask the question since I'm not allowed to look at her file. Her, oh no, don't bother. The doctor never answers her phone. She just doesn't care. Me. Mrs. D, your well-being is important. You should have the answer you're looking for. Let me try. If she sees her secretary number on the phone, maybe she'll answer. 
So I picked up the phone and called her. When she responded, because she always responds or calls back, I looked the lady in the eyes with my biggest smile and I said, Hi mom, I just had a long and interesting conversation with Mrs. D. She has some questions, could you talk to her? The face of this old jerk when she realized she talked crap about the doctor in front of her daughter was priceless and my favorite memory of this summer. My mom said to me that she didn't come back for three months and never talked again in front of any secretary. Karen's sister demands to live with me. My sister, 22, married her boyfriend, 24, of five months a year ago. He doesn't have a romantic bone in his body and is a dense football player type. I asked my sister before she got married if she was sure about this as they hadn't known each other very long and I really wanted her to go to college. She had a family member offer to pay off her complete schooling. I offered to buy her a laptop and help with a car if she went to school. I thought her boyfriend was kind of meh and told her on many occasions so, but she chose her boyfriend and wanted to get away from our parents, which I understood, and I did too, but by going to college. Six weeks after getting married, she got pregnant. She didn't know it could happen that fast. I blame our parents and Christian education. She was thrilled though, and I tried to be happy for her. I worried for her financially and support her emotionally throughout the process. I threw the shower for her, bought her hundreds of dollars in gifts and helped with anything I could. I moved about 9 hours away after the baby was born due to my husband's work. We bought our first home and we're finally financially secure. I'm a teacher with a masters, he's a software guy. My sister has been calling me night after night crying about how unhelpful and unromantic her husband is. He's a cabinet guy and she works at a daycare so she can't afford a house like me at the moment and she's upset about that with him. She doesn't want to be around him or let him touch her. He's a good loyal guy but unromantic, didn't buy her a birthday gift but took her for dinner. He takes care of his son and works but doesn't make a lot at his job. She keeps comparing her husband to mine because he really treats me well and is quite romantic and because he can afford to buy the things I want. Not that I ask for a lot, but we really had to work for our house and are in our late 20s. I've offered to pay for marriage counseling and personal counseling as I feel like she may have some post-birth depression. She says because of the baby she feels trapped. I told her that if things got bad she could stay with me. Because she doesn't have a car, I'd have to do the 18 hour round trip with her. After I said that, she said she wanted to come for two weeks to scare her husband into doing better. Like to me, that's childish and I said no, my house is for if you are done done. She got upset and said I'm not being here for her. But like I'm not going to expel my time and energy to teach her husband a lesson. She called me back and said she's putting her husband on a 30 day trial and will live with me if he doesn't change. I just don't see what's so wrong with him. She's told me everything and I'm just not wanting her to live with me now. I have four cats who are my babies and she hates cats and I feel like she's being childish and I don't want to be a part of her game and waste my time. My mother thinks she's entitled to child support forever. For context, I'm a 25 year old female, have moved out from my mother's place a year ago to live with my boyfriend. I live in another country even. I have two younger brothers who are 23 and 21 years old. My mother just recently called me and informed me that my father had sent her a document and signed letter saying he would be cutting off child support completely very soon. She was absolutely outraged by it and told me that he probably did it rubbing his hands and laughing about it. As usual, she's acting like she's the poor victim and things are being done against her with malicious intent and it upsets me. She has always been this way, nothing is ever her fault. So I did tell her, mom, you're not the victim here. Child support is, like its name implies, to support the kids. But it's all the income I have. That's your problem, with only you to blame for. She did not like that response, of course. I've told my mother to get a darn job for years. Not so long ago, she was leeching off of my salary. Then she kept whining to me about her money issues when I moved out in hopes that I would be giving her money. I don't know what I'm going to do, she'd say. And I know, get a job, was usually my reply. She's the laziest person I know. All day, every day, she sits on her butt and browses the internet. That's all she does. My brother and I would bring her job opportunities on a platter. She always found an excuse not to take it. It's only now that my father is actually going to stop paying child support that she's actively looking for a real job. Why? Because until now, she was comfortable resting on that. But what really drove me nuts is when she said, He's asking for all of your situations 
Maybe since your brother is disabled, he'll keep pain for him, and I can probably get him to keep pain for the others as well, since he's struggling to find work, but he will cut yours off for sure, knowing what a jerk he is. So, one, way to use my blind brother as a money cow. Two, what the heck do you mean, knowing what a jerk he is? I'm 25 and I don't live with you anymore. There's zero reasons why you should keep getting child support for me. In fact, since we're all adults, you shouldn't be getting any more child support at all. You shouldn't have for the past three years. Did you seriously think you could just demand child support forever and live the rest of your life getting free money instead of working for it like everyone else? What the actual heck? My mother is demanding I adopt my niece and nephew. Myself, 26, and my partner, 32, are child free and wish to remain so. Both of our families know this. Recently, my partner's brother and sister-in-law passed in an accident leaving their son who's 12 and their daughter who's 9 behind. My partner's parents have been watching them for months, but they cannot do this full time as they are both in their 70s and have bad health. My partner's sister has also declined adopting the pair as she and her husband are both paramedics and work evenings and weekends. Naturally, they came to us next and after weeks of discussion, my partner and I decided that we would not adopt them. We both know that we would make terrible guardians which is the main reason we have decided to be child-free. My partner's family are understandably upset that nobody can take the kids, but they will now be adopted by family on their mother's side. This means they'll be a few hours drive from all of us. It's important to note here that my in-laws have been incredibly kind during this process, have not pressured us at all, and accepted immediately that we would not adopt them. My mother, on the other hand, has been on my back, saying I'm making a horrible decision and that I need to put the needs of the kids above my own. She has also been mentioning that my partner and I will finally have kids, despite me telling her that that is absolutely not the case. She has always resented the fact that I'm child-free and wish to remain so, and I'm worried that she's seen the kids as a way of becoming a grandmother. I feel terrible that we aren't adopting them, and I certainly feel like a jerk because of it, but it just wouldn't work out in the long run. I need to know, am I the jerk? Edit. Just for clarification, the kids will be going to their second cousin's house, who they are close with. They're not going into the system. Not the jerk. The kids are going to guardians who want them. It would be bad for them to be with someone who resented them, even more so if they were there because your mother wants grandbabies. Not the jerk. Your mother is not thinking about those kids' needs. She's thinking, yay, now I get grandkids and this will make them want more. Those kids are not going into the system. They're going to family who are capable of raising them. You and your partner knew that you weren't able to do the job of raising them and have made the right decision for those kids. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Am I the jerk for making a joke about my brother's affair at his wedding? When I was in elementary school, I was the type of kid who got disrupts class often on their report card, so I never focused much on school. My district had this system where they would pair high schoolers with younger kids to help them with school, etc., and my mom made me do that after I kept getting in trouble. So my tutor was a freshman, Abby. She would come to our house after school to help me with my homework or something. I barely remember. My brother, John, was the same age as Abby, so they would talk to each other and ended up dating. She stopped tutoring me officially after like a month, but since she was at our house a lot, I also talked to Abby a lot, and we were close as well. Fast forward 10 years, Abby and John got married and had a kid together. Five years later, John tells me that he's getting a divorce because he's met someone new. It sucked because I liked John and Abby together a lot, but whatever. Then he tells me he had had an affair with his new girlfriend. Also sucks, and I told him he shouldn't have hurt Abby like that, but whatever. I also asked Abby how she was doing, and she wasn't doing well, but she told me she didn't want her to be the reason I have a bad relationship with my brother. However, two months before the wedding, Abby calls me and tells me that my brother's girlfriend has been harassing her nonstop. She showed me the texts and his girlfriend was saying some pretty disturbing things about how she's so much better than Abby, taunting Abby for having to share custody of her kid now, etc., just making fun of her and bullying her. I told my brother about this and he said he would ask his girlfriend about it. A month later, I asked him if he ever brought it up and he said he did but saw nothing wrong with the texts which upset me. I confirmed that he saw the same texts I saw. Abby apologized for involving me in the whole thing in the first place and encouraged me to still go to the wedding, where my brother asked me to make a speech. The speech went well until I made a joke. 
The gist of the joke was me turning to his new wife and telling her that if she's learned anything from this, she should know that my brother will never let his wife stop him from finding the love of his life. This got my brother and his wife really mad and they kicked me out shortly after and my brother has been calling and texting me non-stop yelling at me. Am I the jerk? You know how vigilantes are technically in the wrong, but we all cheer them on anyway? You're the jerk, but high five. I read the title and thought, really, you're not sure? And then laughed at the joke, so maybe we're all jerks. I think there's a fine line between the jerk and the crapster. They're closely related, but I think they're both their own distinct subspecies. My personal theory is after a normal individual's many interactions with a jerk, there is some sort of DNA mutation which changes the regular individual into a crapster. Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. They're sure not a liar, I know that much. Don't want to work on our assignment? Fine, neither do I. This happened a few years ago in college. I had a class about entrepreneur projects, and that semester was building a business on paper. Basically, we had to figure out what the business would be about, how it would work, and how much money it would need and make. I did this subject in a different class so I could have Fridays free, so I didn't know anyone in there except for one guy. Let's call him Mark. So I teamed up with Mark and three other leftover people to be in our group. At first, things were working like a charm, since we only cared about passing the subject and didn't care about our grades. We would each do a part on an assignment. We had to deliver assignments each Wednesday but we still got max scores on them. Our grade would basically be based upon all of our deliveries, plus some points on individual tests. Important info for later. Didn't take much time for things to go downhill. It reached a point on the project that basically we couldn't modulate the work anymore. The five of us would need to sit together and brainstorm about the next steps, more specifically when we reached the point of how we would earn money with our business. Either that or one person would do everything alone. My group chose the second option, and this would basically be happening for six weeks. On Friday, I would send a message on our WhatsApp group like, Guys, we have to deliver this stuff on Wednesday. When do you want to meet? Saturday, no responses. Sunday, the two checks would turn blue, meaning everyone read the message. No response. Monday, I would send a follow-up message. No response. Tuesday, I would work hard and deliver it alone. Wednesday, two hours before the deadline, someone, usually Mark, would send a message. Hey, how do you guys want to do it? Which I would answer, it's already done. And they would thank me and promise to release me from doing anything on the next assignment, which wouldn't happen and the cycle would continue. After five weeks, I was fed up and got in contact with the teacher. Her response was that it was too late to do anything now because she couldn't assign me to another group and she couldn't give me special treatment. But she told me to check my grades because most likely I already passed the subject. I looked on it and with my individual tests plus what I had already delivered on the project, I got a grade high enough to barely pass the subject. This was kind of messed up, but all the individual tests and project as well, grades were public. So I saw that no one in my group had passed. The closest one was Mark, but he didn't deliver one of the individual tests, so he would still need to do something to pass. I could, then and there, be the bigger person and say something like, Guys, I already passed the subject. Start doing something or I won't do anything anymore. But I can be petty sometimes. On the sixth week, I didn't do anything. Wednesday arrived and Mark tagged me in the group asking if I did anything. I remained silent. Panic started arising. Group members texting me in private. I removed the blue scene icon in my WhatsApp and would read the messages in airplane mode so they wouldn't see me online when reading. Except for the group messages, because they would see that I read them regardless of leaving that setting on or off, so I didn't read them. Apparently, when you don't do anything related to the project in five weeks, it's hard to figure out what to do next. Deadline passes, I go to sleep. Class was at nights, at distance because of lockdown. Wake up the next day, several name callings, assignment not delivered and the group threatening to report me to the teacher. My answer was simple. Teacher is already aware. I'm not doing anyone's work other than mine. You can all buzz off. And left the group. At the end of the semester, only Mark and I passed. They got their crap together in the end, but not enough for the other deadweights to pass. Was the sweetest six. Grades here go from zero to 10. Six is the bare minimum to pass. I ever got. Mark never talked to me again, but it was for the best. Edit. Just had a sad realization. Lockdown happened a few years ago already. 
This was in the first semester of 2020. Dang, I have not enjoyed the last two years of my life. Edit 2. I should have mentioned that it was a private college, and those deadweights had to redo the subject. So, not only did they waste a lot of time, if you didn't pass the subject, there was another one in the next semester that you couldn't do. You also had to pay for it. This happened to me, except it was in med school. My identical twin sister was also in med school with me, and she was assigned to my group. Huge relief. Super easy, as we didn't have to check each other's work, as well as three others. Three-month project. At first, it went well. There was a lot of synergy and participation. By month two, however, that's when participation, as well as contributions from the remaining group members started to wane. We both contacted our professors, Dr. C and Dr. H, and we had a private meeting where they hypothetically gave us advice. However, another two weeks later, it became so apparent that our group members didn't care about the project anymore and expected us to do it all. So we had another meeting and changed the groups. My sister and myself, and them. They were not informed, and if they were, they obviously didn't read the memos from Dr. C and Dr. H. Honestly, they don't know and didn't care at this point. Come presentations, we got up, as well as our group members, who were then instructed to sit down, as it was not their presentation anymore. They all failed. We passed with flying colors. Are you a fan of group projects, or do you hate them? Please let us know. I could never stand group projects. Ugh. Mother-in-law doesn't know when to quit. My mother-in-law and I don't get along well. I've tried for the sake of my husband, but this last incident was the end of the line for me. My mother-in-law has always had this overprotective aspect about her when it came to her kids, which has significantly grown worse with time. Her reasoning behind this behavior is because she felt her mother always took the side of her significant other, and so she vowed to only care about her kids and not their partners. That didn't bother me initially. I figured if I was on her good side, nothing would be to worry about. Until you realize, this woman doesn't have a good side. She would say rude comments to all her kids' significant others. She would always gossip about my sister-in-law's boyfriend, saying he was a drunk and always took her daughter's money. Even though her daughter didn't have a job and the boyfriend would be the one paying for the apartment her daughter lived in and all of her clothes and food. She hated my brother-in-law's now ex-girlfriend. I have no doubt in my mind that my mother-in-law is part of the reason why they ended up breaking up. I never once saw my brother-in-law stand up to his mom regarding any rude comments she ever said about his girlfriend. He would simply turn away and ask everyone else to handle her. Like, really, dude? I never understood her thought process because the things that she would come up with would be outright delusional. It was only a matter of time before that crazy would make its way towards me, and boy, did it. When we were at her house, she blew up one night because I wasn't doing anything. I didn't help clean up or anything, but neither did anyone else. Apparently, I needed to clean off the dinner table and wash the dishes for seven people while at her house. Even my brother-in-law agreed. Even though he will literally sit on his phone the entire time while everyone else does prep work or cleans. So the next night I did it, even though my husband protested against it because I was a guest at her house. She would be in these weird moods where she wouldn't even acknowledge me when we came over. She just went straight to hugging my husband and saying how much she missed him while giving me a who's this jerk look. My husband would sometimes force me to initiate a hello and hug, but it came to the point where it was like, why should I when she doesn't like me? It started to get worse when I did something. Even while at my own home, mind you, she would flip out and start yelling and all of them would need to calm her down. When she would be at our house, she apparently would expect to be treated with the utmost respect, which is where my petty self came back with a no. You do not get to be disrespectful or callous to me in my own home. The icing on the cake is when my mom was with us and we stopped by to say goodbye before heading out. She was talking to my mom, asking my mother all of these weird questions about her name and everything. She took pictures with my mom and then she looked at me and then snapped. She started going off about how I'm the reason her family has so many problems. She's been through so much because she hasn't been able to see her son for so long. I was in utter shock. I didn't know what to say. I was simply looking at my husband like, what is going on? Then she gets up in my mother's face asking her a bunch of questions about why we got married, telling my mom that I take away money from my husband and that I'm a bad person. My mother didn't say a word but my heart sank when she started to cry because my mom had gone through so much with a vindictive mother-in-law for her 35 years of marriage to my dad. 
My husband defended me and my mom, even with my mother-in-law screaming at me that she was going to call the police on me and put me in jail. He tried to talk to his mom about her behavior and that it was unacceptable, but she refuses to apologize and believes she did no wrong. Her whole reasoning for snapping like that is because her friend told her that women will sometimes marry men to take their benefits. She does not think my mother is my real mom and that she is helping me in the process of using my husband. At this point, I'm convinced my mother-in-law belongs in an institution. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law believe that my mother-in-law did no wrong and that she had every right to behave this way. They keep telling my husband that this is your family and that he should put them first before me. I told my husband that because of how disrespectful she was, I do not want her at our house anymore. If he would like to go spend time with his family, he can freely do so by going to visit them. Is it wrong of me for being tired of being treated like I'm disposable to my in-laws? For asking for something as simple as common decency? I've never acted out or caused a scene in front of them. I've done so much for these people and they don't see it. Till this day, I'm still excluded from the family circle because I refuse to stand for this when behavior is rude and condescending. You are not wrong in this. She and your brother-in-law and sister-in-law are for defending her. They're disgusting people with atrocious behavior. I don't know how you lasted this long without kicking her out. Please stand your ground so that she's not allowed in your home and cut all contact. You're absolutely right. If he wants to see them, he can go on his own. You do not deserve to be treated like this in any manner, but especially not in your own home. Your poor mom. How much water do you want exactly? I deliver bulk water to people who don't have access to city water or their own private well. For nearly all customers, it's a simple process. Either they call for deliveries or they have agreed to automatic deliveries. When I show up, I hook the truck up to the fill pump and start pumping and either listen at the vent or hook up to an installed alarm in order to know when the holding tank is full. This particular customer had their holding tank installed in a small utility room next to their living room and didn't install a vent to the outside and refused to allow us to install an alarm because they didn't want us to put the 1 4th inch hole in the wall to run the alarm wire. Solution? They call when they need 2,000 gallons of water and we show up and pump exactly 2,000 gallons of water. This procedure worked without a flaw for over a decade. Literally hundreds of deliveries with no issue. Q owner deciding to sell. We're contacted by the new owners and set them up as a new account and head over for our first delivery and meeting. We especially go over the issue with us being totally unable to tell them when the tank is full. We offered to install the alarm again for free, but they declined. So we let them know when they call for water, they must be sure they have enough room in the tank for 2,000 gallons or to let us know how much water they have room for. We went over this several times and they laughed saying they understood and would be calling when they were below the 2,000 gallon mark. Two weeks go by and we receive a message on our answering machine from the new customer. No gallon amount is specified. This set off a warning bell though because it was a household of two and it's only been two weeks since we filled them last. That's highly abnormal. We expected more like five weeks. So we call back just to double check. No answer, so we leave a message asking for confirmation. Couple hours later, we try again. By the next day, we had left four messages asking to confirm that they were ready for a full load. No reply. Well, they did call, so boss sends me out. I knock on the door as a last attempt, still no answer. So I hook up, start the pump, and set the timer so I don't over pump while reading my book. 15 minutes later, I hop out to check on the water meter. 1,700 gallons. I'll watch for the next couple minutes and shut it down. That's when I hear the front door burst open and the woman who bought the house and had called us in yesterday is screaming to shut the water down. There's water everywhere. What are we doing? This woman has been ignoring our calls and even ignored me at her door and now she's screaming at me. Apparently, she had called when the tank was half full instead of down below the mark, showing where the 2,000 gallons is and just disregarded all our messages and didn't feel like talking to me when I knocked. So now she has 700 plus gallons of water in her living room. Boss was called out so she could scream at him. Husband came home from work so he too could scream at us. For reasons, I guess. They made a lot of demands about how we were going to pay to fix it. Nope. Boss laid down how we saw the situation. You can keep the water free of charge. Just don't call us for water anymore. Y'all are too stupid to work with. Never heard from them again.
I mean, it's a bit weird that you just continued to go out even after leaving multiple messages with no reply. This really does seem like you or your company's fault, like you just wanted to trash their house because they didn't reply to you. Remember, this isn't the Culligan guy. This is a tanker of water driving to rural areas. The protocol described exists so as to not waste anyone's time. Due to the incredibly tedious nature of the job, the call was placed and after that human intervention is the only way to stop the delivery. You want to live in an area where you live out of tanks? You have to be a certain level of responsible to do it. It's really that simple. Well, whose fault do you think it is? The company or the customers? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for making a thing because a bartender showed my ID to random customers? I went out the past weekend with two friends. I'm 29, but I have a baby face, so I still get carded regularly. I'm used to that and have no issues. Well, we went to a sports bar slash restaurant place and the bartender, Trent, carded me. No big deal. Then some random guy was sitting a few seats away and said, How old is she? Trent said, Well, she was born in 92, so 29. I was holding out my hand expecting to get it back because I thought he was done. Random guy said, No way, let me see. And Trent walked over and handed him my license. I said, Um, excuse me, can I have my license back? Bartender said, Yeah, just a sec. Then the guy next to random guy took it and looked at it. When Trent finally gave it back, I sarcastically said, Thanks for passing my personal information around. My friend Lily that knows Trent said, They were just messing around, calm down. So I didn't say anything else about it till we were on our way home. I said, I can't believe you're friends with that tool. Lily said, He was just kidding around, you need to lighten up. And apparently him and Billy and Rob are friends. If it was something that just had my age, I wouldn't care, but my license, like everyone's, has my first name, last name, address, and I don't know Billy and Rob from a hole in the wall. When I told my boyfriend, he laughed and said, they were probably trying to flirt, and I should have just let it go, that my past is causing me to be paranoid, because I had a coworker borderline stalking me a few years ago. Luckily, he didn't know where I lived, but he'd show up randomly when I was in public a lot. I'm sure if he knew where I lived, he'd have shown up there too. It bothered me Sunday and Monday. I could easily not go back there and probably won't, but my thinking is, if he's passing around my ID, he's doing it to other people. I called the place yesterday and asked to talk to a manager and said what happened. Lily called and yelled at me earlier. She said that they were just messing around, it wasn't serious enough for you to call and get him in trouble, that I embarrassed her by acting like an uptight jerk and making a big thing over a joke. Maybe they are harmless and it was probably just a joke, but it's more the principle of it. Am I the jerk? Should I have just let it go? Not the jerk. You didn't agree to the bartender passing around your ID to begin with. That is private information and the fact that your so-called friends and boyfriend are defending it is BS. You expressed how uncomfortable you were with that and nobody seemed to stop and really think about how the joke isn't funny and you didn't appreciate it. I feel like if I was OP, I would be like, yeah, you are right. Let me see your ID real quick. Oh, random stranger that my friend doesn't know? You want to see my friend's ID with her state identification number? Used to verify checks sometimes. And her address so you can possibly show up randomly? Then hand it right back to her. Not the jerk. If your license works like it does in my country, it has your address on it. Contact the owner and tell them what their employee is doing. It's unsafe and I'm not sure if it's even legal. Anybody who sees it could in theory turn up at your house. Trent is stupid. Not okay, not ever. Am I the jerk for being excited about finally getting into the same college my sister left? I, 22 female, have a problem and while I'm trying to be empathic to my sister, Mandy, who's 20, I can't help but feel angry and resentful so I wanted to come here for an outside perspective and discuss this with, hopefully, unbiased outsiders. When I was in middle school, my parents thought that it would be a good idea for me to visit an older cousin, Jen, 28 female, that I was close to at her college campus. I was excited to see her again, so I agreed and fell in love with the school she went to. It was going to be my goal to go to that college and I studied hard while working a part-time job to help save for tuition. I was so excited when I applied because I was so confident that I would get in and was crushed when I was waitlisted then rejected. I locked myself in my room and cried for a few days because I was so focused on this one school, I didn't prepare myself for a future that didn't include it. Fortunately, Jen was kind enough to visit, allowed me to whine about my disappointment, 
talked about community college, and gave me the pep talk I needed. I took a year off to just work and then went to a really nice community and during that time Mandy applied and was accepted into my dream school. Apparently she fell in love with it too and while she was smart enough to apply for other schools, the one Jin went to was her first choice. I'm not gonna lie, a part of me twinged inside knowing that my sister got into all the schools she applied for and I really started to feel negative about myself. But I worked to keep it to myself and even helped pay for some textbooks. Despite being upset with myself, I was still really happy for Mandy. Her first semester, she opted to do it remotely because of lockdown, but in the spring, she moved into the dorms, and when we would talk, she seemed happy. Then one day, she came home early and apparently wasn't going back. I didn't ask why, because it seemed like a sore subject. Then I applied, got in, and managed to get a partial scholarship and was overjoyed. I had to take an alternate path to get there, but I was finally going to be able to go to my dream school, and since I did all my gen eds at my community college, I was going to have very little debt. I have been over the moon, but recently Mandy exploded at me for bragging. I still don't know all the details, but apparently Mandy was kicked out, and she thinks I'm cruel for not only applying to her school, but making posts about it on social media and telling everyone in the family because it's drawing attention to her situation. I'm more than happy to tone it down, but our mom thinks that me getting in is reward enough to just stop talking about it, like at all, no social media posts, mentioning my school life to family, and to not even say the name of the school in the house, but I don't think that's very fair, because when I was upset about not getting in, I didn't tell Mandy to be quiet about her joy. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Seems like they did not have the same rule for your sister when she got into your dream school. Too often, the kid that whines and complains the loudest gets catered to, and the one that tries to be the bigger person is relegated to that role permanently. Mom, when Mandy got into this school, I did not expect her to hide her joy or keep quiet about her life to protect my feelings, and you didn't ask her to do that either. Back then, her joy was considered more important than my disappointment, and now that the tables are turned, her disappointment is more important than my joy. Can you please explain why my feelings, good and bad, always take backseat to hers? Karen fired me wrongfully, so I ended her company. Hey everyone, I decided to share my story. It all took place 17 years ago, but I feel like it belongs here. At that time, I was 20 years old and dated my first true love. We'd been together for one and a half years already, and everything was great. Her mother really liked me, and she had her own company, which traded fashion clothes for kids. She made a ton of money. They needed someone to drive one of their three five-ton trucks, and she came up to me with the idea to hire me because I was unhappy with the job that I had. So as a win-win situation, I accepted her offer and we started working together. Job was okay, even though I had to work a huge amount of overtime because she thoroughly introduced me to how the whole company worked. She had a huge storage facility, a store, and two trucks, one that I drove and a big one. I worked for her for like one year and in that time I knew every single thing about the company because she trusted me with also the dirty secrets. This later came in handy. This is where things took a huge turn. I found out that my girlfriend cheated on me with her ex, and as a result, I broke up with her instantly. It was an ugly situation, and after it went down, I called her mother and told her what was going on, and that I don't want to mix things with business, so I will still be there for work, even though I don't want to see her daughter again. She said everything is alright, but of course she sided with her daughter and I felt that she's mad at me because of the breakup. I went to work and acted as a professional should, took all the drama aside. However, soon after she singled me out and started looking for mistakes so she could discipline me. This had been going on for months and I realized she was just waiting for an excuse to fire me, but I wasn't going to give her that reason easily. She was upset that she couldn't find big mistakes and the small ones she often just made up were not enough to terminate me. So she came up with a plan. On the truck, we had a power generator, which provided a light and a power for laptop, a printer, and so on. It worked in two ways, with fuel when we were on the road and with a cable in case we were at the storage. But it was not made by a company. They just hired an electrician for that, and he made an error, so we had to flip a switch all the time if we used it with a cable connection, otherwise it would burn out. As I loaded the truck, she convinced a coworker to flip the switch back, and after a few minutes, the lights were gone and I noticed something was wrong. It burned out, of course, but I knew I didn't forget the switch because I had loaded the truck for an hour and it only took five minutes tops to burn out, so it couldn't have been me. She didn't even hear me out. 
she just started yelling and fired me on the spot and stated that she was going to pay the repairs out of my last salary, so don't expect any money from her. I didn't take that lightly, and I told her, I don't think you want to go this way with me, but she refused to listen. It took a few days for me to cool down, but I wanted to give her a last chance. I called her and told her even though I knew what was going on and that she did set me up, if I get my money, I will call it an end and we don't have to see each other again. She told me to buzz off, so I came up with a plan. First, because I knew that the store she had didn't have a bathroom which was illegal in my country, the shop assistants had an agreement with a restaurant on the opposite side to go there if they needed. I reported this to the authorities and the next day they closed the shop because of this violation and told her that she can't open up until they have a bathroom. She called me right away and asked me if I had anything to do with this. I laughed and told her, didn't I tell you that you don't want to go this way with me? And I hung up. I knew that we worked so much overtime that me and the other driver had so much overtime on the cards. It records how many hours you drive and how fast and when you stopped. So I called the authorities again and told them everything. They went and checked all the records and gave the company a brutal fine. She sent me text messages all day long after that. I replied, ain't done yet. Then silence. A few hours went by and my phone rang. She called and asked me if we can talk it over. She even said she'd send my last paycheck, but I shut her down immediately and told her, too late for that. Then I called the fire department and told them the wires that they had in the walls of the storage were outdated, which caused short circuits daily and that they only had two fire extinguishers for the whole place when they should have had like 12 to 15. On that very day, they had to close the storage as well, so she lost the last place where she could make money for months until they got everything up to date and renewed all of the wires, which cost a huge amount of money. Because of the fines she got from the different authorities, she couldn't afford these renovations, of course. A few months later, she filed for bankruptcy. I know, because my ex-girlfriend called me with, I hope you're happy, jerk. You made my family bankrupt. I never got my paycheck, but at that point, I didn't even care anymore. I was happy with the outcome. I hope you enjoyed my story. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.